What an interesting quote to open up this new season. Considering the fact that the person quoted is a fictional character from a short story, which the story involved the King of Yellow, who we know the Yellow King was heavily throughout the season 1 of True Detective, which in my eyes makes this new story a perfect sequel to that incredible season. As it is time for us to discuss and break down episode 1, part 1 of season 4 of True Detective. We're introduced to this mysterious man who's on a hunt for reindeer. As he singles out one of them and is about to shoot, the sun begins to set and all of a sudden this herd of reindeer seems to be afraid and jumps off the cliff. Now I'm assuming they jump to their death, almost like something triggered them or something was awakened. Now they all seem to be doing their normal routine, from washing clothes, working out, reading a book, one of them's even watching Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and we even see one of the scientists is on live on their phone while making a sandwich. As one of them named Clark appears out of nowhere as he's shaking as if something or someone has taken over his body as he says, She's awake. And out of nowhere, the power goes out. Now what exactly happened and who is she? We'll be talking about that a little bit later in this breakdown. But I do want to point out before moving on, is that the same coat that Anne had on from the picture that Liz finds a little bit later in this episode? As we cut to December 20th, which is the third day of night, as the delivery of supplies have arrived, the driver can't find anyone to sign off of this drop off, but he briefly sees a mysterious person running across the hallway, which I believe might be Clark, who I think is the only scientist that might still be alive. You'll notice the glitch in the television, something that happened several times throughout this episode when it appears that someone is getting closer to figuring out what's actually happening. Now we see this driver drops his keys and all of a sudden he finds a tongue. What an extremely creepy and chilling way to open up this season, but more particularly, I'm loving the hint at the supernatural here. Now taking a look at these opening credits, we might have some easter eggs or some clues about what to expect in this season. As we see a polar bear which is missing an eye on a rocking chair, it looks like Liz is drowning is that foreshadowing for the character a little bit later in this season. We see a graveyard, a paper saying protect our water which I'm assuming is something from Anne who we know is a protester a little bit later in this episode. We also see a reindeer with red eyes and of course we have the heads of the screaming scientists. Did you all notice any other easter eggs or clues? Let me know in the comments below. As we get our first introduction to Evangeline Navarro, I found the small talk that she's having with this guy to be very interesting as she notices the shortage of crabs and he tells her that it's been getting worse every year. Now, as we'll talk about later in this breakdown with the death and the murder of Anne, I wonder if that shortage happened shortly after Anne's death. And again, the supernatural of it all, that things start to go bad after her death and is she the one that's awakened? Now, we see that there was a physical altercation between a boyfriend and a girlfriend and one of the employees stepped in and knocked out the boyfriend. And in this scene, we see that Navarro's character is really being kind of played up. As it's said a little bit later that she's someone that stands up for others, she's someone that stands up for those that's being taken advantage of or abused as we learned this guy did hit his girlfriend has a history of hitting his girlfriend and I believe the young lady name was Blair and Navarro listens to her story and she takes her side so I think that this scene as we'll talk about later with Liz and her introduction this tells us a lot about what we can expect of this character so I'm very much intrigued by this character as she sees to have her own demons that we'll talk about a little bit later now we see that Navarro gets a phone call which by the way we never find out who called her and what the call was about and the next time we see her is in the scene with Liz in her office asking about that tongue. I'm going to get more into who she might have been on the phone with here in a second but speaking of Liz let's talk about the introduction of Liz who's one of our main characters played by Jodie Foster as she arrives to the crying scene of the missing scientist. Now you'll notice the cover song playing in the background is One of Sorrow which is a nursery rhyme and this nursery rhyme is a song for children talking about magpies. Now of According to old superstition, the number of magpies seen tells you if you're going to be having good luck or bad luck, which is something that I think we should keep in mind a little bit later as we move forward with this show, because I don't recall seeing any birds or magpies in this episode, but there's definitely an emphasis and focus on animals that we see in this particular episode, so I wouldn't be surprised if we see a magpie a little bit later in this season. 
As she enters the room, she races to turn off the television that still is playing Fear is Bueller and the song Twist and Turn by the Beatles is still playing. Now Liz claimed that she's not a fan of the Beatles, which there might be some truth in that, but I think that the song might have her deeper meaning to something bad that happened to her in the past. Now Pete fills Liz in and we'll later find out that Peter is actually the son of Hank. As we learn that this researching location has been running for over 18 years, they research things as far as geology, biology, but more importantly, the impacts of climate change. As we learn what each scientist specializes in, we see that Clark is someone that specializes in microorganisms that are associated with prehistoric materials. Now, did Clark stumble upon something prehistoric that might explain that supernatural possession that was taken over him? As we find out that they lived there all year long, as Peter tells Liz that he believes they're looking for the origins of life. Now Liz finds a writing on a board that says we are all dead, clearly written after all of them were taken. I really enjoyed this character beat from Liz as Hank assumes that the sandwich was fresh, but we see how good Liz is at her job as she quickly is able to put together how long they've been missing based on the mayo on the sandwich and she also can smell the bad clothes in the washer. Now I do want to point out about the comment that Liz makes about the mayo as she says that she learned this because her kid left their lunch in the back seat as we'll talk about that kid Holden who's someone that she lost at some point of her life. As they take a look at the tongue on the floor, Liz points out the marks and says that this belongs to a native woman. Now I want to talk about the behavior of Hank in this scene. Now there's a quick scene where we see him reading something very suspiciously, but more importantly when they're in the kitchen, he's texting someone and he doesn't seem to be paying attention. Now I believe that this could be the wife that we find out that he's going to be marrying a little bit later in this episode, or... Do we believe that Hank was maybe texting Navarro and tipping her off about the discovery of this tongue? Now here we're introduced to Rose who is Phil dressed in a wolf and as she's listening to the radio playing you'll notice that there's a glitch in the radio very similar to the glitch on the television as that wolf who's dead is slightly moving she turns around to find who we later find out as her dead son Travis who's trying to communicate with her from the dead. Again, another sign of the supernatural, which I'm absolutely loving so far in this show. Now here in this scene, we get our first encounter between our two main leads, Liz and Navarro. And immediately you can tell that there's a level of respect that they have from one another, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they like each other as Navarro questions if the recently found tongue belonged to Anne, who we find out was murdered six years ago, in this case seamlessly consumed her because she couldn't let it go. Now Navarro knows that this tongue belongs to a native woman, but Liz kind of jokes with her about this unreleased information because she speaks to animals and spirits in her dreams. Now I think that animals but also dreams will play a big part into this season. But again, the question I have is, how did Navarro know about this information? Again, I'm under the belief that Hank was giving her this information because he knows how important this case is to her. Now Liz requests that Peter finds Anne's case so she can kind of look into it a little bit more, but she's interrupted by a phone call because Leah got caught recording sexual activities with her girlfriend. Now as we're introduced to Leah, who is arguing with Liz in a car, they almost get into a car accident, and as Liz checks on the driver, as she's approaching to the car she slightly steps on ice and we get this very quick cut scene of someone walking in daylight and immediately cuts back to the accident now i'm to assume that liz connected this accident to something that happened to her or something that she experienced which i think might explain holden who we know is her son who appears to be dead now we learned the person that liz got into this accident with goes by the name of stacy who appears to be the town drunk now going back to Navarro, we get a little bit more information regarding Anne as we meet her brother by the name of Ryan. As Navarro is taking this discovery of the tongue as a possible connection to Anne, it might be connected to the missing scientists. We find out that Anne was a protester and an activist and she wanted to make a change and this pissed off a lot of people in the town, especially the people that worked in the mines. Now Ryan tells Navarro that he got into a lot of arguments with his sister about her protesting and that if the mines were to ever get shut down, there goes the town. 
So you can start to put the pieces together in regarding that Anne was someone who was concerned about climate change. And as Peter told us a little bit earlier in this episode, those missing scientists also studied a lot of different things. But one of the things they studied was climate change. So you can make the connections that maybe Anne was in a relationship or was friendly with one of those scientists, as we'll talk about a little bit later in this breakdown. Now we see Ryan asking her if she believed in God and we see her response is yes. Now as she's explaining her yes, we see this scene where she cuts back to her last tour and one of her who I assume was a close friend of hers, their face was half missing but they were able to whisper something to her which we don't find out what she said but I'm assuming we'll learn a little bit later in some point of the season of what actually was said to her at this moment. Now sticking on Navarro, we meet her sister by the name of Jules. Now there seems to be some type of mystery or some type of situation going on with Jules because it is important to her that she doesn't turn out like their mother. Now there is talk about not taking her to a hospital. Now I might be wrong, but going back to Liz mentioning to Navarro about spirit animals and dreams, I wonder if Jules is having like mental breakdowns or paranoia or more importantly, like these very vivid dreams. And maybe their mother had similar type of situations that went on with her. And maybe the people of the town called her crazy for having these dreams and talking about animals. And again, maybe Jules is having the same type of dreams and maybe she's even hearing whoever this woman is that has all of a sudden been reawakened. Now, cutting back to Liz in her office, talking to Peter, who's given her information about where the funding of this research center came from, as he mentions that one of them was a non-governmental organization. But as he's about to say who else funded this company, we see Stacy screaming in the background, disturbing everyone. But I want to know who else was funding this particular building, which I think is a mystery we should keep an eye on moving forward. Now, as they go to check on Stacy, I found it interesting that we see Liz is taking like these digs at Hank, not only in this scene but earlier when they were in that kitchen at the research facility she talks about how he is a dad that didn't make sandwiches but also that him and Stacy have been hooking up in the past as he mentions that he has a girlfriend that he's going to turn to his wife in a couple days but I'm very interested in this relationship between Liz and Hank. Did they have a secret romance or maybe a public romance that went wrong? Because again, you can tell that there's some type of tension between these two characters. Now cutting to a very important scene in my eyes, as we head to Peter's house, and this is where we meet his son's mother by the name of Kayla, but also we meet a son by the name of Darwin. Now Darwin is drawing a woman who seems to have X's on her eyes or blood, but also has blood running down her hands as well, as we see Peter's girlfriend says that these are stories maybe that her mother would tell their son Darwin as he was being babysitted by her. Now my question is, is this the same woman that Clark was talking about being awake? As Kayla says that this is some type of local legend, I'm very curious to learn more about this legend and if this supernatural entity has anything to do with what's going on in this episode. Now we see the scene between Kayla and Peter. They're sharing a little bit of an intimate moment together, but that's interrupted because Liz is calling Peter to go to his father's house to get Anne's case files as we see that taking place in the next scene. Now I do want to point out in this scene between the father and son, one, do you all think that Hank knew that Peter took the case file, but he just didn't want to impress him about it? But then also when Peter lies to say that he went over there to get a picture to show his son when he was younger, we notice there's a woman in that picture. Now, I'm assuming that that is Hank's ex-wife, but also Peter's mom. But my question is, where is she? Did they have a divorce? Did their relationship not work out? Was there infidelity involved? But also, is she even alive? As we quickly cut back to Rose, we see that she's following Travis into the darkness of the snowy night. Now back at Liz's house, Peter presses her about giving him information about the connections that Liz has between the sciences and Anne. Now this is where we get the tragic backstory of what actually happened to Annie Kay as she was stabbed 32 times with an unidentified weapon that was never found and that it made star-shaped wounds and that her tongue was taken out and that was never recovered. 
And again, this is where we find out that she was a protester that drove the workers and minor folks mad and she made a lot of enemies. As we got that backstory involving Anne, we also found out what happened to Navarro. Now, she got into several fights with the locals, with the people that worked in the mines, but she also seemed to get into some type of mix up with a character by the name of Kate, who sounds like someone you don't wanna bother. Now, I don't know if Kate is maybe the mayor of the town or maybe an owner of the mines, but this behavior or obsession forced Hank to take Navarro off the case. Now, we also find out that Liz isn't a local, but she came into town and she actually worked very closely with Navarro at one point. As Liz was convinced that the town killed her and that the killer would never be found. Now, back with Navarro, we meet her buddy by the name of Havoc, who is someone she sleeps with on her own terms. Going back to Liz, as we have a conversation between her and Leah, who brings up people drinking drunk and how they never talk about that day. Now, they don't go into details, but Leah tells her that she doesn't have to be her mom. So now I'm thinking that maybe Liz was maybe the wife of Leah's father and they had a kid together and that kid and also their father died in a car accident involving someone who was drunk or maybe Leah's dad was the one that drunk and maybe killed Liz's kid in a car accident and she kind of took it upon herself to become the mother of Leah. As Leah says that her dad would understand why she wouldn't want to continue to take care of her. So let me know what you all think is this relationship between the drunk driver, Liz, Leah, and her father in the comments below. As we see Navarro briefly cross his path with the guy that she met at the beginning of this episode and overhears him talking about what he's going to do to Blair the next time he sees her again, as Navarro pours beer into his truck, I'm wondering if something bad is going to happen to his truck. Is he going to get into a car accident and she's going to have some type of guilty conscience? Now back with Liz, we find out that her son's name was Holden. Now as she was sleeping at night, she hears Holden calling out her name and we see a small hand touching her shoulder again. I believe that dreams will play a big role in the show, but also we even hear Holden say, She's awake. Now, do you all believe that Liz believes in this local legend that seems to be mentioned throughout this episode? As this clearly would wake someone up, she sits up and sees a polar bear with a missing eye on the floor. Now, I couldn't distinguish if she was aware that this polar bear was on the floor and that polar bear belonged to Holden and she keeps it close to her late at night, or... Did that polar bear just mysteriously appear in the middle of the night? As we wrap up the episode, we see Navarro calling who I believe is Anne's mom to kind of reopen this case and make some connections between Anne and those scientists. And again, all of a sudden, we hear that glitch from the TV, from Rose's radio, and now we have it in this scene as Navarro stops in the middle of the road because she sees a polar bear with a missing eye and we hear... Yeah, hello. Again, now, is that polar bear actually there? Does this polar bear have any connections to Liz about that same polar bear that she was holding in her hands that was missing an eye, but also the same polar bear in the opening credits? As Liz is now up in the middle of the night, or maybe it's the morning because we don't know because it's always night during this time of the year, she reopens Anne's case files and compares them to the missing scientists as she discovers a major clue. Now it appears that Anne might have had a relationship with one of the scientists and that scientist was Clark, who we met at the beginning of this episode who seemed to be under that possession, who was wearing the same jacket in this photo. And also I wanna point out, she sees that same polar bear in one of the photos as well. We end with our final moments here with Rose watching Travis performing this dance routine as he points her in the direction of where the scientists are. We see that Liz goes back to look for that jacket as she runs into Navarro who's looking for something that she can connect to Anne and Liz tells her about her discovery of this jacket but they have no luck finding it because Clark actually had the jacket on. Now Navarro confronts Liz about why she can't let this case go. After being the first one on the scene and finding Anne's body, she she saw the hate displayed on the body and the abuse after killing this person and also the taking of the tongue was a sign of shutting her up. So this is so important because this just gives us more context of what is driving Navarro to finding out what happened to her because this seemed to be a passion of hate. 
As Liz gets the call about Rose's discovery, you'll notice the lights are flickering yet again, another sign of when the characters are finding out something important to this case, some type of supernatural entity seems to be around. As our final shot shows Liz and Navarro on the crime scene, finding at least three of who I assume are the bodies of the now dead scientists. Now, I found it very interesting that Rose and Navarro had a brief conversation about Travis being dead, but when Liz walked by her, they said no nothing to each other. So now I'm starting to think, could Travis be the one that was involved in the death of either Leah's father or maybe even Liz's son? If you think it doesn't make sense, remember it does. We're just not seeing it yet because we're not asking the right questions. Are what we're witnessing grounded and rooted in reality and everything has a logical scientific reasoning behind it? Or are we dealing with supernatural beliefs or supernatural entities? as it is time for us to discuss and break down episode two, part two of True Detective Night Country. It is December 21st, the fourth day of night. After discovering the missing scientists last week, we immediately start with seeing the conditions their bodies are in. They're all completely nude, some of their corneas are burnt, their eardrums are ruptured, and some have appeared to have bitten some of their own fingers. Whether they did this to themselves or someone did this to them, this is a brutal and horrific way to die. Now may I remind you all, doesn't this look and feel familiar? Remember the drawing from Darwin in episode 1 of the town's legends with the eyes and fingers missing too? I don't think this is a coincidence. But maybe the most important thing about this horrific discovery is the spiral marking left on Lund's head. Now you all will remember he is the founder and director of the research station. Does that mean anything that the head of the research station is the only one with this marking? Could it be a sign of protection or maybe this can lead to resurrection? Now Liz knows this will ultimately be a shit bowl as she calls it. No answers and a bunch of angry people. But on top of that, their department doesn't even have a forensic technician. Now I forgot to mention this in last week's video, but did you all notice the logo on their uniforms is the polar bear? Now while we didn't see the polar bear in this episode, there are some easter eggs that I'll point out later, but I think the polar bear will play a very key role in the rest of this show. Now Liz mentions how sending this case to the largest city in Alaska, Anchorage, would probably be the best thing for them, which one would assume that they are more equipped to handle these type of cases, but she immediately changes her mind. Now we can see just how unprofessional or how unprepared or just not how used these type of cases are to this department as one of them gets the chainsaw going and one of Liz's men takes a selfie with the deceased. Now Hank says they're just blowing off steam and personally I don't think taking a photo with finding bodies like this is the best way to do that but this to me speaks to a larger concern that I have not only with this police department but Hank in particular and what he may have covered up at some point. Now I want you all to remember this for later. As Liz puts her foot down and reminds them that this is an active crime scene and to at least pretend to know what they're doing. Meanwhile, Navarro looks on from the distance as Rose suggests that she go home and leave this for someone else as she responds by letting her know that she believes and she knows that this is tied to Annie. And Rose knows that just like Annie, this case may have a similar outcome, which is no answers. Well, at least for now, as Rose invites her over for later. Now, did you all notice the whispers as Rose walked away from Navarro? Now, I'm starting to believe that Navarro seeing that polar bear last week and the flashback of her friend with the half-blown face-off and what happens later in this episode with her finding the necklace, is it safe to assume that Navarro shares the same gift or curse that her sister and her mother had by being able to communicate with the dead and she's just choosing to ignore it? As we see Navarro stepping back, she discovers clothes and shoes neatly folded and lined up in a very particular way. I'm starting to think that the scientists had an audience witness their murder, or some might call it a ritual. As Liz seems to have her officers behave, one of them accidentally breaks off Lund's arm and out of nowhere, he screams in pain and he's alive. Now, I wouldn't categorize this as a jump scare per se, but I would be lying if I didn't admit that was creepy as hell. Now, again, I want to point out that that was Lars' arm who, again, had the spiral on his head, so maybe he'll have answers, but again, did that spiral keep him alive? 
Now, last week, I pointed out that the opening credits have Easter eggs that might point towards answers of this show. And if you'll notice, this week's ending shot has a very different ending than last week's as we see the inside of Clark's trailer where he had what seemed to be a shrine of Annie. So moving forward, we should keep an eye out for these opening credits because they might have more Easter eggs and also gives us a clue of what to expect in the episode. Now, Liz finds out that her lone survivor won't be able to talk to after having his leg amputated and in until he's out of his induced coma. As Liz pays a visit to the local school to speak with one of the teachers by the name of Bryce about what he knows about what they did at the station. Now we find out that Liz and him had a sexual history together or as Liz calls it, desperate times. Bryce tells her that the scientists were very committed. No one came in, no one came out. They worked for decades trying to discover an extinct microorganism cure that could stop cellular decay. In layman terms, this can cure cancer, autoimmune diseases, genetic diseases, disorders, this would be, as Bryce called it, a game changer. Now Liz questions why it took them so long, but Bryce reminds her that this just wasn't a walk in a park and many things could have happened that caused their research to fail. Now he personally didn't believe that they were never going to be able to find what they were working for, but I personally have a theory that maybe they did have a breakthrough or at least Clark did and he found what they were looking for. As Liz gets a call from Lulu to head back to the station. But the question that was left on everyone's mind last week and wondering if there were major connections between season one and season four is finally revealed. Now we catch up with Rose and Navarro as she wonders how long Rose has been speaking and seeing Travis. As Rose tells her that he only comes when he wants something as we get the backstory. Before taking his own life by going into the ice, Rose and him shared a moment that was a goodbye for him without her knowing. Now he had leukemia but wanted to go out on his own terms. Their last moments together involved homemade croissants, a song, and lovemaking as he took it all in before he left her. Now for those who haven't seen season 1, this might not mean much for you all, but for those like myself who not only seen season 1 but also loved it, this moment is pretty significant and can lead to one of two things. Now, Navarro was the one to find Travis, which is a theme so far this show that she tends to find dead people, but Rose says to her, this was one last gift from Travis Cole. There it is. This is 100% confirming that Travis was indeed the father of Russ Cole, played by Matthew McConaughey from season one. Now, I don't want to make this a huge deal because I think this might just be a smile back at the fans, but I do want to fill those in who are unfamiliar with this connection or for those that don't necessarily remember. Now, here's what we know from Russ's dad based on the little that was shared during season one. Now, Russ's parents met in Texas. When his father returned from fighting from Vietnam, his mother left the family, so we can call Rose maybe his stepmom? Now, Travis and his son Russ moved to Alaska and had what, according to Russ, was a tense but working relationship. Now, Russ said that his father was disappointed that he left for Texas as an adult, and he really didn't confirm what actually happened to his dad besides that he died of leukemia, which again was confirmed at his scene. But we also know that he lived the rest of his life off the grid. Well, now we know that he lived the rest of his life with his love, Rose. Now, showrunner Issa Lopez confirmed during an appearance of the Watch podcast that this season is in conversation with past seasons, revealing that the spiral from season one would appear in this season, which we know from episode one and now in this episode. Now again, this is very fun. This is an exciting way for fans like myself to get happy, but I don't think it means that Russ will be playing a role in this season or making a cameo. And honestly, the timelines don't really add up considering that Russ talking about his father took place in 2012 and this particular season is taking place in current times. But then again, the flashback that we saw between Rose and Travis could have been years ago. But I do want to share with you all this audio from a clip of Jodie Foster on Jimmy Kimmel's show about a week ago talking about this show and Matthew McConaughey's involvement. Come back. I saw it last night. It's, I love this series. And uh, it's um, I know Matthew McConaughey is still an executive producer on the show. He is. He is Did because he's in there somewhere in, in the mix. Uh huh. OK. All right. All right. Very good. So the question I have for you all, was this moment just fun for the audience or will Russ Cole make a return? Now, back to the actual scene. 
This is a very important and key line from Rose. Now, Navarro asks about Rose first seeing the dead, and it began with Travis, but she believes it has to do with where Ennis is. She believes that the world is getting old, and Ennis is where the fabric of all things are coming apart from the seams. Now, Rose isn't afraid of communicating with the dead, as she says that some of them visit just because they miss the living, some visit to tell you something that you need to hear, and some just want to take you with them and knowing the difference is important. Now again, Navarro's unexplained experiences so far that we've seen, I personally believe that the dead is trying to talk to her, trying to communicate with her, and trying to help her with this case. As Navarro talks about Jules and how she sees people following her and has difficulty sleeping, and that the breakdown she's having is involving hearing their dead mother. Now Navarro brought her sister to Ennis to keep her close, but after what Rose said, maybe her being here is amplifying her abilities. But going back to the importance of Rose saying, don't confuse the spirit world with mental issues. That right there tells me what's going to separate this season from the rest, as it pertains to the handling of the supernatural, particularly with season 1 and season 3 of True Detective. Now, season three hinted at the supernatural, but ended up being a little bit more grounded and logical. But season one, in my opinion, really played with the supernatural elements for a lot of the show, but presented it in a way where the supernatural was kind of a result of Russ being a drug addict. But everything with the Yellow King and the cult and their sacrifices still makes me question that. But neither here nor there, this line that Rose says makes me believe that, yes, characters like Liz will have a difficult time believing in the supernatural natural but having her son hold and touch her last week and the things that I believe she'll probably see moving forward she'll probably become a believer and I do feel as though the supernatural being involved in this case will be more definitive now as Navarro leaves Rose they mentioned the lighthouse being a place that can help her sister during these mental health issues but then we have Rose bringing up the spiral found on Lund's head and she draws it out in the snow and the symbol is something that Navarro has seen years ago Go. As Rose tells her that she believes that this is super old, maybe older than the town, even older than the ice. Now, Navarro having seen this could be from Annie's tattoo that we'll talk about later, or did Navarro see this elsewhere? Now, to spotlight this spiral and what it can mean, and in relation to season one of True Detective, now the spiral was closely associated with the Yellow King, a mysterious and seemingly cosmic entity that motivated ritual assaults and murders. Now, spoiler for season one, our heroes do find the killer, but the details of the Yellow King remained a mystery. So again, the question being, is this at all attached to the murders of season one of True Detective, and is Ennis where the spiral originated from? Back at the station, Liz sees that they have a visitor and it is her boss, Captain Connolly. Now, he wants the case to go to Anchorage, but Liz refuses and we see Connolly insist and calls a chopper to get the bodies. Now, she fills him in on the regulations and lets him know that the bodies can't go anywhere until they're thawed out, which takes 48 hours. But the question is, where will Liz keep the bodies? As we cut to the local ice rink where Liz comes up with the ideas of where to keep the bodies, which is at this rink, but first she must get the permission from the character that we heard about last week, and that is Kate, who we know Navarro got into it with, and as I speculated, it sounded like Kate is someone that you don't want to piss off because she seems to be a very important figure and might indeed have ties to this actual Annie case. Now, I want to spotlight this interaction between Kate and as she calls him Henry and not Hank. She asks how Pete is doing and that he should do private skating coaching for her boys and Hank says to her that he'll try to talk some sense into him. As she tells him, she's counting on him to do that. Now, some of you might be saying, oh, that's a nothing burger. We shouldn't pay too much attention to that interaction, but I disagree. Remember last week, it was said and it was shown to us that Hank had the case files of Annie and remember I said that there was something suspicious about him? So my working theory right now, especially after this interaction and something that happens later in this episode, what if Kate, the owner of the rink and the mines, is very much aware of what happened to Annie and has some, if not most of the police department, including Hank, in her pocket and covered up Annie's case and wants Peter out of the police department because he has a moral compass and he would probably tell the truth of what happened and call out the corruption within the department. I know that's a bit much, but let me know if you all feel a similar type of connection with Kate. Now, to add more fuel to the suspicions of Kate, she agrees to allow Liz to bring the bodies into the rink, and she says to her, she's only doing this. Just so we're clear, 
I'm doing this because I love this town. So again, I believe that Kate had Annie killed because she loves her town. Annie was beginning to destroy this town by all of her protesting with the mines. And as we know from what Ryan said last week, if you shut down the mines, you shut down the town. So Kate took it upon herself to shut down Annie. Now, as the bodies arrive, we see Peter notices the self-inflicted bite marks as Liz wants him to look into the files to find any similarities in past autopsies, as they now have a count of five heads out of the eight, with one being in the hospital and the two remaining believed to be buried. Now, Navarro arrives on the scene and shows Liz the symbol found on Lund's head is the exact same one that Annie had as a tattoo. Now, Liz plays it off like there's no connection and laughs at her and tells her that she doesn't want to work with her ever again and has her leave the scene, but immediately calls Peter over to look into this as he comes up with the idea of unlocking one of the scientist's phones with fake recognition. Back at Havoc's bar, Navarro shows Ryan a picture of Clark and he's never seen him before. But this new character by the name of Chuck comes outside and interrupts them because he's pissed that she's bringing up Annie again, which we know minors and Annie's is a very sensitive topic for a lot of these minors. Now, just like Liz, Navarro picks up on everything. She notices how Chuck looked at the picture and pays him a visit a little bit later in this episode. Now, this might be a bit of a stretch, but is anyone else getting the feeling out there that Ryan might know exactly what happened to his sister Annie? But he's deciding to keep quiet because he doesn't want to lose his job. Job. As we saw last week, he has a kid and he is probably sharing custody and maybe he needs his job more than anything and he's willing to keep quiet about his sister's death so he can keep his son. Now back inside the bar, this fight breaks out as tensions are high because some of the townspeople are upset about the water supply being bad because of the mines. Now that cult in season one worshipped and believed in the Yellow King and that making sacrifices would get them closer to them. Are we maybe making a correlation that people in the mines had to make sacrifices? sacrifices by poisoning the water and making sacrifices to the children and Annie to get closer to their king. Back at the rink with Liz and Peter, this might be my favorite scene of this episode as they point out that the prints on the shoes had no matches and Liz's working theories are that the sudden drop of the pressure can cause the rupture of the eardrums and the damaging of the soft tissue and that the hypothermia can cause the irrational behavior, but why drop everything and run out in the first place? Now, Peter suggests that they saw Polar Bear in a panic. He says they ran out, they were undressed, as we see Liz says, we'll start asking the questions. He continues, who drew the sign on Lund's head? Which she says was the wrong question. Then he brings up, when was it drawn? If it was before, it could have been some type of game or ritual they played, but after, maybe someone was on the ice with them and they mentioned the clothes being folded that wasn't them, but maybe. <gasps> I really enjoyed this scene. This to me is like the classic moments in a murder mysteries that I love to see. Seeing two people trying to figure things out is so important to me in these type of narratives. But as it pertains to the show, to me, this just shows how good Liz is, is at her job. But also seeing Peter being really good and figuring things out and trying to figure out the unexplainable. This bond between them is really working for me so far. But the question is, will it continue to work? Who's going to mess up first? Will it be Liz? Will it be Peter? Also, her taking him under her wing to me looks like her positioning him to be like a replacement at some point. But again, I feel like this is the only officer that she can trust in her department. As we see Peter showing Liz the video that we saw from last week's episode of when Clark was caught on camera, but this time from the phone's POV and whatever happened end up cutting off the power to the cell phone. As we cut back to Havoc's bar, there's a conversation between him and Navarro as he lets her know that he's hearing that there's maybe protesting coming soon in the town because of the whole water situation being black in some homes. Now, going back to what I mentioned about the supernatural and Kate and the minds being involved, going back to this spiritual side of everything and being able to communicate with the dead, what if this spiritual, whatever this legend is of the town, is trying to warn the people by telling them that there's something evil going on at the mines? Now, there might be a possible foreshadowing going on in this scene as he makes a slick remark about his female dog playing tough, but really is a softy inside like Navarro. But the line she says to him about his dogs eating him one day. Now, like the caribou jumping off the cliff in episode one, could something happen where the dogs are triggered and they end up eating their owners? Let me know if you all are thinking the same in the comments below. As Liz and Peter go to question the supplier and the cleaners at the research station, one of them, after seeing the symbol, calls it witchcraft, not a cult. 
as it's also brought up that Annie was a midwife. Now, this might be another one of my crazy theories, but what if Annie was caring for a baby that Clark and the scientists found during their research? And maybe, just maybe, there's some connections to the town's legend. But I want you all to put a pin in this because we're going to bring this back towards the end of this breakdown. Now, some of them saw Clark acting weird and crying in his lone room. Now, as Peter is questioning his supplier, he learns that Clark once walked around nude and he saw that symbol as a tattoo on his chest. Again, I said the polar bear wasn't seen in this episode in the physical form, but as you'll see in the scene, there's the polar bear on the wall. As the supplier reveals to Peter that he thought that he saw someone that night, but wasn't entirely sure because this is Ennis and people of Ennis see dead people all the time. And I love this line here. You grew up here. You know this. You see people who are gone sometimes. It's a long fucking night. Even the dead get bored. Again, the show wants us to keep questioning the believability of what's real, what's made up, or what's superstition, what's a part of the town's legend. And of course, these people are maybe sleepless with these endless nights. So I love the back and forth of what's real and what's not. Now, Navarro ends up getting the location of Chuck to question him. But on her way there, she experiences something kind of weird. Now, as the Spice Girls play on the radio, she accidentally drops her phone and she reaches for it and she discovers a neck necklace and not just any necklace as we quickly cut to this scene which appears to be the younger Navarro and her young sister Jules being afraid of their mother who appears to be having one of her mental breakdowns but you'll notice she's wearing the same necklace as Navarro throws it out of the window was that a sign from her dead mother as Rose said they want to warn you they miss you or they want to take you with them now, was this even real? Because again, last week she saw that polar bear in the middle of the road. I'm personally believing that she is getting signs from her mother and she's just too afraid to listen. Now, Navarro questions Chuck and finds out that Clark did purchase a trailer from his cousin for this unreasonable price, all cash. Now, this was seven years ago, a year before Annie's death. Now, I thought it was very interesting that Chuck mentioned that his cousin died of bone cancer and that Travis was diagnosed with leukemia and the scientists were trying to discover a cure for cancer. This can't all be a coincidence. Now, this is a quick scene, but I'm very curious of where this subplot is going, and that is involving Hank having this scene, exchanging sweet nothings to his soon-to-be wife, who should be arriving soon, as she brings up that her mother's sick, and of course, he's sending her money. Now, could this all be a spam? Will she actually arrive? Will they get married? What will come of this plot? Is it significant to what's going on? Let me know what you all are thinking about in the comments below. Now, as his soon-to-be wife requests pictures of him, he notices that Peter took Annie's case file. As Peter fills Liz in on the question I had last week, besides the non-governmental organization, who else is paying for that lab? Well, we learn that it's a shell company, NC Global Strategies, a company that has their hands in everything. Now, remember what they did at the research facility was finding a cure for all the major diseases, which to me would sound like something a company like that would be very interested in. Now, it seems like this was pointless information, at least from Liz's perspective. But again, going back to my suspicions of Kate and the mines and the sacrifices. What if this company is in line with the cult from season one who were known as important figures that were attached to very important people, is it all connected? As Liz makes Pete stay and watch over the bodies as we see an upset Kayla as Liz comes to pick up Leah. Now we see Liz is pissed to see that Leah has allowed Kayla's grandmother to draw on her face, a drawing attached to their heritage. Now, I'm not too entirely sure why Liz was so upset. Is she afraid that once she gets closer to her heritage, she'll want to leave her? Or maybe she thinks and maybe knows that there are some people in this town that are prejudiced against the natives and she doesn't want to what happened to Annie happen to her. As we get this quick character moment that might seem insignificant now, but I think will have a big playoff at the end, and that is we see Navarro suggesting to Jules that she go to the lighthouse, but Jules disagrees and she wants to be treated normally and promises that she will not be their mother. Now, I can see her having some type of breakdown later in the season and it getting worse, or maybe she will be able to communicate with the dead and maybe even talk to the scientists and figure out a way to help out this case. As we continue to get these little character moments, we see Leah 
idiot in her room who kept a drawing on her face and she sneaks out to visit her girlfriend. Now, I can see this kind of subplot involving her getting connected to her heritage and her girlfriend, maybe playing out in a way where her and Liz have a falling out because she probably is going to be involved with the potential protesting, which we know Liz doesn't want that because we know that the people in town, what they did with the last person that protests. So I can see that plot being something we should keep an eye out for moving forward. Now, Liz is starting to put up the Christmas tree and finds the bear that we saw last week in a box, which means that that was a dream, that that bear wasn't in the room. But we cut to this flashback of her and her son Holden with that same bear and the bear has two eyes. Now, it's important to point out that the song playing in this scene is the same song playing on the television in last week's episode, which we know she was upset about. It was a song about the Beatles. Now, remember I said that this might be a triggering moment for her. She doesn't just hate the Beatles. This moment leads to something which appears to be evident in this scene in this moment. Maybe this was the day that Holden died. Now, I thought that maybe Holden was involved in a car accident, which still might be the case, but what if it was more disturbing? What if Holden was attacked by a polar bear and was killed by that bear, but Liz was able to shoot the bear in the eye, but it was too late, and that's how Holden died. Now back with Peter, his dad pays him a visit as he slaps him for taking the files. He says that even their mother didn't steal when she left them and tells him that Liz doesn't own him and he's got a family and blood is blood and he should remember that. Now, what does that line mean for the future? Will Will have to decide between his dad and Liz? And will we ever see his mom again? Now, speaking of Liz, she pays a visit to her captain and this visit leads to them having sex as they have a little bit of pillow talk going on and them saying that this is the last time they'll be doing this, which by the way, they've been doing this for over 19 years. And it also appears that Liz had an affair with him. As they discuss why she wants to keep the case as a way of getting back at him, and again, I think he wants her off of this case because she'll figure out things and how it's connected to Annie, which again ties back to Kate, as he makes a slight threat towards Liz, which forces her to leave. Now back at the station, Liz contacts a tattoo artist that gave Clark the symbol, and she discovers where he got the inspiration from, and it was Annie. As she heads over to Navarro Station, she shows her the tattoo was done four days after Annie's death. And just in case you wanted to know what year the show is taking place, you can see it right here. It's in 2023. As we also learned that the tongue from last week was indeed Annie's. As it is official that Liz and Navarro will work together again, but there is a mention of someone by the name of Wheeler, a topic that Liz doesn't want to discuss. Who's Wheeler and what did they do to him? Now, I might be wrong, but if we take a look at this screenshot here, this is from the actual main trailer of the show, and it appears that this gentleman might have killed this woman, and where my mind is that this is probably Wheeler, and maybe he attacked Liz or Navarro, and one of them shot him, and maybe they got rid of the body and they didn't file it. Just another example of all the secrets that this town keeps. As we end this episode, I thought this was a very interesting Easter egg. You all will notice that it says Blue King. Is that a reference to the Yellow King? As Leah and Peter talk about old times, Hank used to play the guitar and seem like a pretty chill guy and Peter mentions that he wants to be nothing like his father growing up and wants to be a better dad than his father. Leah talks about the story how Liz and her dad had good times back in the day and the theme to me in this scene was and the focus of the scene is not being their parents and being good enough seemed to be something to focus on. So I'm again, this episode had a lot of great character moments and this being one of them. Now after Navarro scared the hell out of Havoc, they start to share pancakes and have a conversation. She shares with him that she can't believe how Annie was able to keep the relationship with Clark a secret, but she uses Liz's method of asking the right questions as she realizes that Clark got the trailer to keep their secret private and she heads over to the Nook, which is a place to keep secrets. We see Liz going through Clark's notes and she finds this circular drawing and all these crazy notes from Oh God, never say her name. I can hear her name. Her fingers are cold and dark. Her eyes are dark. More of these notes, her faces and hearing her. So it's clearly that he was losing his mind. The question is, was this immediately after losing Annie and has he been doing this for the past six years? And the bigger question is, did he find a way to bring Annie back? As Liz gets a call from Navarro and they look inside to find some very interesting things in this trailer. As they find animal bones on the table and they suggest that it probably is the bone of a caribou i'm starting to think are these the bones of the caribou that we saw jumping off the cliff last week does it have anything to do with bringing her back 
As they continue to look around, they find drawings all over the place as they also find Annie's phone. And lastly, they see this small body made up of different clothing materials in the symbol of the spiral on the ceiling. As we see Annie's pictures is above this body, remember me mentioning that Annie was a midwife? Maybe this figure was created by Clark and this person he was referring to to being alive is not Annie, but something that they created out of witchcraft. As Peter calls Liz because there's a problem at the rink, there's only six scientists and we know that one of them's at the hospital, which means that Clark is still out there and he's alive. And what about her tongue? Yeah, well, what's, what's your explanation for her tongue popping up six years after she dies? And what about the men on the ice? Why'd they go out there? All important questions, questions that we'll try to answer and understand as it is time for us to discuss and break down episode three, part three of True Detective Night Country. As we open this episode with a flashback dating us back to April 22nd, seven years before our main timeline, we officially meet Annie Kay as Navarro is here to arrest her because of trespassing and destruction of property at the mines facility, but Annie's a little bit busy as she's in the middle of helping a woman give birth at the last birthing center in the region. Now, the woman giving birth doesn't seem to be a fan of Navarro, but Navarro finds herself helping in this pregnancy. Now, this is something I noticed throughout this episode. There looks to be pockets of the indigenous people of the town who don't seem to respect Navarro. As the baby arrives, you can tell that something's off, as the mother notices the baby isn't crying, as they perform CPR and the baby's okay. Now, I immediately thought to myself, seeing the joy and relief on Annie's face when she was able to help that baby, what if she experienced the unfortunate event of seeing these babies not making it out of their birth because of the mines? But what if she found a way to not only shut down the mines, but also assure the safety of her people? As we see Navarro taken in this moment, and you can see her perception of Annie has changed. Less than five minutes ago, she was here to arrest her, but now she has this understanding of the care that they have for one another. It's almost like she got a sense of family. Now, I was under the impression that, yes, Navarro was close to Annie's case because it was awful what happened to her, but I also thought that they were close. But again, this scene shows us that this was the first time Navarro actually met Annie, and she only knew her a year after her death. Now, I wonder if they had other interactions after this, and if Annie was like a gateway for Navarro to get closer to her heritage, but things changed after Annie Kay died. Cut to present day, December 22nd, the fifth day of night. We see Hank calls in reinforcements to search for Clark, but we see that they're not all policemen. Some of these people are regular civilians who are locked and loaded with weapons and ready to kill on sight as the hunt for Clark begins. As Hank gives the orders and they head off, Navarro reminds him that they want him alive, but Hank questions if that's true. Now, of course, it's assumed that Clark is the killer and responsible for the death of the scientist, but also the main suspect in any case murder, but I don't believe that to be true. But I want to go back and talk about Hank questioning if found, Clark should be put down. That's not proper protocol if you ask me, but I wonder if Hank got the call to kill Clark from Kate or the powers that be who are behind the funding of the facility, they gave the call to kill Clark because he knows too much. Now, quick little detail, you'll notice that Navarro picks up an orange that one of the men dropped. As we cut to the opening credits, which shows the same orange in two shots. You have one of the orange rolling down on the ground, which we see later in this episode, and then you'll see here that the orange is peeled in the spiral formation. Now, as I pointed out in my last video, this time around, the last shot of the opening credits show the little red house that we see in this episode, which every end shot of the opening credits have had some type of significance or importance to that particular episode, and I'll be explaining the importance of this location a little bit later. Back at the station, Peter fills Liz in on the forensic technician who's booked on a evening charter, and Lund is still in a coma after getting both his legs amputated. Now, Clark's items from the trailer has been gathered in the evidence area, as we see Liz is preparing to look through those 19 boxes as she tells Peter to call her new partner on this case, Navarro, which comes as a surprise to Peter. Now, Peter is given the orders to figure out a way to crack Annie's phone, but he's got a question on his mind for Liz. He wants to know what exactly happened between Liz and Navarro on their last case involving Wheeler as Liz closes the door and gives him the details. Now, this was filed as a murder-suicide as William Wheeler was a bad individual with a long track record of crimes. Even after multiple convictions, he managed to find his way out of jail and he came across an 18-year-old in which he got into a relationship with who he ended up a 
abusing multiple times, but the girl never reported him. Everyone knew where this was headed as it was just a matter of time before things got worse as they eventually got the call. As we cut to that call, we see Navarro and Liz on the scene together, but they were too late as the girl was dead. But remember, Liz said that it was a murder-suicide and that they were both dead when they got there. But we see clearly in the scene that William Wheeler was alive. Which leads me into my theory that I mentioned in my last video that they did something to Wheeler and they kept it off the books. Now they knew that he most likely would have gotten away with this and they decided to take matters in their own hands, a secret that they kept between them. As Liz says, and Navarro felt that there was more that could have been done and things got nasty between them and that's why she was transferred to the troopers end of the story. Now we don't get the rest of that story in this episode but I wonder if it'll be brought up again and if we will see what actually happened. But if we don't see what happened with that case do you all think that Liz or Navarro shot Wheeler and who do you think came up with the idea to say that he took his own life? And also that tune that he was whistling will that have any significance moving forward? I bet that one of them most likely Navarro will end up hearing that whistling at some point later in the season and we'll find out exactly what happened with Wheeler. Now this was a small detail that I don't know was mentioned in previous episodes as Liz mentions to Peter to keep an eye on that bruise that his father gave him but that he was a big time hockey player before all this so the questions I have one why did he quit and why did he become a policeman and two obviously she knows that he was lying about falling on the ice and that being the reason why he got the bruise but mentioning the hockey player pass this was said last week by Kate saying that he should teach her sons how to skate and now we have it here. So now I'm starting to think, is this some type of foreshadowing evolving around Peter having a big moment on ice sometime later down the road in this show? But more importantly, it's brought up a few times that there's a possible intimate relationship between Peter and Liz that we'll be discussing a little bit later. Back with Navarro, she tosses the orange she found, but it mysteriously makes its way back to her and there's a whisper as she senses a presence surrounding her, but she gets the call from Lulu. Now this is just more proof that every single week that she's had some type of connection with the unknown, whether that's the polar bear in episode 1, the necklace from her mother that she found in episode 2, but going back to episode 2 with Rose telling her, does the dead either miss her, do they want to tell her something important or warn her, or do they want to take her with them? As we head back to the station with Liz and Navarro teaming up to look through Clark's belongings. One by one, they take a look at each of the items. They begin to see if they could find a way into this secret relationship. I love this shot of this almost symbolizing the endless circle as they're surrounded by all these moments between Annie and Clark and it can't be a coincidence that them in the middle of this circle and there was a nice touch as you all can see the photo of the spiral it being a key to their relationship. As Liz finds a photo of them and she knows it's from spring of 2016 by the shirt that Annie is wearing she notices the hair change in one of the photos as Navarro points out that they both seem to be happy in this relationship. But Liz says, how does this hot, fun girl end up with this weirdo as Liz wants Navarro to play the game of asking the right questions, which is, why did they keep it a secret? As we have a moment to cut to tension in the room with this brief moment of levity between two characters, we see Liz question Navarro if she's still sleeping with Kavik, and Navarro fires back with mentioning Liz's past relationships as Peter walks in the room. This moment does spark the idea for Navarro to question Kavik later in this episode. As Liz yet again shows her attention to details as she points out that one of the photos was taken by someone who wasn't in this relationship, but the question is who, as they find some blue hair dyeing on one of the photos as they head over to Susan, the stylist. As we find out that Susan lied to Navarro as she questions her, Susan brings up how many times Annie was stabbed and that was a clear message for her to stay out of this. We notice that Susan's little girl is worried, but Liz takes it upon herself to get the little girl some food and ease her stress. Now I don't know if it means anything but this is the second time we've seen Liz with little kids and her being the complete opposite and being nice in a way towards those kids as she is the complete opposite with adults. Remember how nice she was for Darwin when he was building his Legos last week and now we see this little girl. I believe that maybe Liz sees like Holden in these kids and again it's just a small little character detail that I've noticed and I really appreciate. As Susan tells Navarro that she would go to the station to give the scientists haircuts, but one day Annie begged for her to tag along. 
as Annie was apparently obsessed with coming with Susan, which I found to be very interesting. Now, as one thing led to another, really hit it off, and they talked all night, especially after she showed him her tattoo, which Clark took a very big interest in. Now, Susan says that Annie always dreamt of this tattoo when she was in high school, and once she got it, those dreams stopped. Now, my major question is, why was Annie so obsessed with going to the station? Did she know what they were doing or what they were researching? Now, Annie having this tattoo coming from a dream, will we see or learn about these dreams? And did they lead her to Clark and they were destined to meet? But also going back to what I said earlier about Annie finding a way to help her people. What if the dream led her to Clark and she used him to get into the lab and had to get close to him in order to find what she discovers at the end of this episode? Now, during this conversation, we cut to Liz with the little girl. Initially, I didn't take much into her distracting the girl with innocent stories about unicorns skating on ice. But it is interesting that if you look up unicorns, you'll find that some people look at unicorns as a symbol of purity, innocence, and power. As it's also said that unicorn's horns can purify poison water. Such is the strength of their healing power. Now, we all know that the water in Ennis is going bad. So do we expect to see some unicorn popping up somewhere down the road? Or if not a unicorn, do we maybe think that that polar bear will serve as a unicorn that we've seen so many different times in the show? Will the polar bear be the one that help out with this water? As Susan talks about how Clark was quite weird and she noticed a change and Annie once they got together. Annie didn't want anyone to know about this relationship and Susan thought that to be very strange. She didn't tell the police or Navarro about this because after what happened to Annie, she was terrified. Plus, she was seeing a guy at the station as well and his name was Oliver. Oliver was an equipment engineer who left right before Annie died. Now, he's a hunter who's living on the ice and doesn't want to be found. I wonder why he left the facility in the first place and did he have some type of disagreement about what the scientists were actually doing there? Now, Susan does reveal that after Annie's body was found, she did indeed call the police at some point and she told them about Clark as she said that she spoke to someone. Now, it's not said who she spoke to, but we all know it was Hank, someone that I've been keeping my eye on since episode one. As we cut to them in the car, Navarro mentions how Hank took her off the case and buried this information about Susan Collin as Navarro knows something is corrupt and the mind is behind it all. Navarro goes over all the obvious connections that the mind is being involved as Liz reminds her that half the town works for the mines and of course people would be complicit in keeping things under wraps to keep the town going because of the mines. As Liz goes on to bring up the key questions about the sciences and Clark and why did the sciences Scientists go on the ice as Navarro gives her this look that points towards things going a little bit beyond the logic as Liz mentions come on don't give me that voodoo ET cosmic chumpa loompa Liz just doesn't want to attempt to understand what's possibly going on with the supernatural or the spiritual now yet again, we get a little bit of comedy in this scene as Liz's phone goes off and it's a Tinder notification and hearing her reasoning of how she picks and chooses her radius was pretty funny to me. But I do want to point out, while they shared some scenes together in the first two episodes, they mostly spent a lot of time apart. But seeing them looking over the evidence found in Clark's trailer to playing the good cop, bad cop scenario with questioning Susan to them having this ride along and the banter, I'm liking these moments between the two characters and I really enjoy their chemistry together. As Navarro shares what she does on her lonely nights, which is watching Netflix, which by the way, I'm surprised HBO allowed some other brand to be mentioned in their own platform, but she also talks about how she prays. As Liz kind of laughs at her and Navarro responds by saying she doesn't talk to God, but instead, I listen. As Navarro goes on and talks about disappearing and just going off without stopping, you see that Liz seems to kind of understand what she's talking about. Now, I want to point out the theme throughout this episode that Navarro has this sense of searching for something or being welcome into a loving type of community or a loving type of situation. Now, it's very clear that she loves her sister, but also one can say that Taking care of her sister can be a burden on her. The thing that I really enjoyed about this episode that it really is focused on is you can't pick your family that you're born into. 
Which, speaking of family, back at the rink, I was thinking that Hank took Kate's advice of trying to convince Peter to drop being a policeman and getting back on the ice, but instead, I questioned if Hank was maybe genuine in this moment as he brings Peter's old skates that he found and he mentions that, hey, if you and my grandson maybe has an interest in skating and Hank saying that he would like to join them if they decide to go for a skate, was this a real moment for Hank or was he somehow apologizing for sapping his son from last week or was it something else entirely? As Navarro and Liz arrive and Navarro goes straight to Hank and presses him about Susan's call. Hank claims that he dismissed Susan's call because she was rumored to have multiple relationships with men in the town as Liz steps in and tells him to go back to his search and tells him that he's going to get written up for mishandling Annie's case which leads him to telling her that he might report her for playing Mrs. Robertson to Peter. Now for those wondering, the Mrs. Robertson is a term used to describe an older woman pursuing someone younger. It's also a reference to a song that became the character from the 1967 movie, The Graduate. Now, I mentioned it earlier, but let's just talk about it. I've always perceived Liz and Peter's relationship to be kind of like a mother-son or a mentor-mentee, but after this scene and the gentle touch across his face with the bruise and the late night working and taking all of Liz's calls... Do we now believe that there was maybe at one point a romantic relationship between Peter and Liz? Now Navarro is clearly pissed that Liz is just going to write up Hank for what he did and she ultimately leaves, which we see Peter telling Liz that the forensics guy is behind because of the weather, but Peter has an idea. He suggests to bring in his cousin who's a vet that might be able to help. As we know, Liz is on a clock from Conley as the 48 hours are almost up and we see the bodies are nearly thawed, which by the way, I love the detail of the body's thawing as it proceeds to the truth melting away or the lies or secrets or these blocks of ice these characters have built around themselves is slowly melting away. Now a perfect example of what I mean by this is displayed in the very next scene that displays the importance of the end of the opening credits. As Navarro pays a visit to Kavik who's in the middle of nowhere catching fish asks about Oliver. Reminder that again this is the same location we saw in the opening credits. Now Kavik claims that he doesn't know him as she wants him to go around and ask where he can find Oliver. Now he'll do this but in exchange for her to give him information and that is telling him something about herself now initially she refuses but we know how important this case is to her so she ultimately goes back now, Kavik wants to know about her mom. As we learn that her mom was a local to Ennis who worked in a gold mining camp that no longer exists, she left at the age of 15 and went to Boston where she met the father of their kids. Their dad was abusive to her and the kids, which end up being the reason why they end up moving back to Ennis. Now, I don't want to glance over the fact that her mom worked at a gold mining camp in Ennis. Might be nothing, but we know that there's something going on with the mining community currently in this, I wonder if more facts will come out about her mom and if anything will tie into what those old mining camps were into or even the whereabouts of her father. Do we maybe believe that he found them in Ennis and he was the one that took her life? As she talks about her mother experiencing the same things that her sister Jules does and that one day she just got up and left and never came back and she ended up being dead and she was murdered and they never found her killer. Again, will we get more of her mother's story? And I wonder if her mother's death is at all connected to any of this is going on. As we learn that Navarro never was given her native name. As she begins to say that she wished, but then she ends up stopping as it's now time for Kavik to give her her intel. Again, knowing that this little fish hut was in the opening credits and knowing it was used for fishing, I believe metaphorically speaking, it was to show Kavik as us, as the audience, fishing for answers for Navarro's past. Now circling back to the melting away of these characters and this scene being the reason why, I believe the closer Liz and Navarro get to facing their past or listening to what the supernatural or the spiritual is trying to say to them, the closer they'll get to solving both of these cases. As we take a detour, remember the importance of wanting to be a part of something or welcome to a community. 
It's fine. Anybody who cares is welcome here. As we meet up with Leah and her girlfriend who are going to this gathering with the protesters against the mines, you hear them mentioning all the wrongdoings of the miners and the effects that is happening on town as we hear some very unfortunate news. As it's announced that a baby of one of the members was a stillborn as they have a moment of silence. <laughs> Now, I think it's safe to assume that the death of the baby was in result to the effects of the mines. Now, I'll be honest, I don't really know or have a clue where Leah's subplot is leading to, but I will say I feel like her story is missing one or two scenes to really bring her characters to these motives to where she's at so far in this show. But speaking to the scene, for me, it showed Leah feeling a sense of belonging, but I feel this will cause a rift between her and her stepmom, Liz. I can see Leah getting more involved with the protest and something bad happening, or she'll discover something very important. But my biggest takeaway from this scene and many others in this episode is showing us the effects the town has from the mines. Whether it's their water, their air, and even their loved ones are losing their lives because of the very thing that keeps the town financially stable. Now back with Liz, as she's looking over the case files of Annie, listening to White Noise, she looks to be starting dinner, but she stops. As she puts the food in the fridge, she hears something coming from the fridge. Now I couldn't make it out, but it sounded like an echo or a whisper. Which leads me to wondering, was this more signs of the supernatural or something or someone from the dead trying to reach her? Or my super conspiracy is, what if her house is being surveillance and they're trying to listen in to what Liz might know? Now Liz stops listening to this noise because Leah is now home and she finds out that she's been around the protesters and she yells at her and tells her, do you know what happens to those people? Now I took that line as her referring to the people getting arrested like we saw Annie at the beginning of this episode or end up dead like we know what happened to Annie. As we see, Leah just wants Liz to care more about what's happening to these people as she brings up what happened to this baby earlier. Now, the news doesn't stop Liz from forcing Leah to take off her markings on her face. And honestly, I felt bad for Leah in this moment, but I think in Liz's eyes, she believes that she's protecting her. Now, as Liz heads back downstairs, she's looking over Annie's dead body on the photos, and I felt like in this moment, she's starting to show or to look closer to this case, but more importantly, she's starting to care more and she's taking this more personal. Because honestly, I think that she sees Leah in this photo. And just to bring this up, we still don't know what happened to Liz's husband and Leah's dad, and I wonder if he was a protester, or was he more in tune with his roots, and this might have caused the issue in their relationship, and Liz doesn't want to go through this again with Leah. As we cut back to Navarro, she yet again senses something, and she sees what appears to be a child in the distance. She chases after this child, but she ends up slipping on the ice and hitting her head. As we cut to her in a dreamlike sequence, waking up in the daylight, you can hear a whisper, and it sounds like someone says, listen, to me, which is implying that she needs to listen like she listens during her prayers. As a child holding the same bear that we've seen before, as we don't see the face of the child, but I think that it's safe to assume that it was Holden, as Holden puts his hand on her shoulder and says, Now the location is unknown, but if you look behind her during this scene, you'll notice that a accident has occurred. Now I mentioned it back in episode one that I think that Holden might have gotten into an accident, but then I also said in episode two breakdown that maybe he was attacked and killed by that polar bear. But more importantly in the scene, if this is indeed Holden, is she trying to send a message to his mother Liz through Navarro. As Navarro gets a call about her sister as she's had a recent breakdown and said that someone was coming and she ended up running off work as Navarro knows exactly where to find her sister. Now Navarro finds her at this abandoned boat on ice. Not sure why she's here but I would guess that this is maybe a place she goes when she has these types of breakdowns even when she was maybe younger. As Jewel talks about the water and the sea she talks about thinking about bad things. Now I'm wondering who she was referring to about someone bad is coming but also going back to her comments about the water and the sea and does she know the connection between the bad water and the minds and is the supernatural trying to communicate through jewels and jewels trying to tell her sister to look more into the minds. 
As we head over to Peter's house, he tries to sneak it in, but ends up making noise and waking up the whole house. We have him and Kayla talking about Liz and the control that she has over him as they talk about the difference of when they first met and him becoming this cop. And he ultimately gets interrupted because you guessed it, Liz is on the phone asking about Oliver. I do want to talk about going back to maybe an issue or a criticism that I have. Similar to the Leah plot, I feel like the Kayla and Peter's family drama seems a little bit forced and there's not enough evidence to really kind of boost up this subplot. Let me know if you guys are feeling the same thing in the comments below. But pointing out back to back to back scenes, illustrating these characters being almost identical in their situations, dealing with the differences or misunderstandings amongst their loved ones. Whether that's Leah wanting to be a part of a community and doing something that matters and Liz having trouble understanding that we have Navarro not being able to fully understand what her mother and her sister were dealing with and then again we have Kayla not being happy with Peter's commitment to his job with Liz's orders now I'm wondering who's going to reach their breaking point first will it be Leah will it be Kayla will it be Jules or who will possibly lose the person closest to them first because of this case. As it is December 23rd, the sixth day at night, we cut to seeing Liz walking into what I assume was a prayer session amongst the women as we see Liz has to step away, almost like this was too much for her to take in or to be around. We see her in the bathroom and she's washing her hands and she sees just how bad the water actually is, yet again another reason for her digging more into what's actually going on with these mines. Again, this episode putting an emphasis on these characters really listening to what's going on. We have Liz talking to Leah about what's going on with the people and what happens to that baby. And literally, she's seeing firsthand the conditions that some of these people of the town who live closer to the mines are going through. Back at the rink, the bodies continue to melt as Peter's cousin, Vince, takes a look at them. Vince tells Liz that they didn't freeze to death. They actually died before they froze. He believes that they might have suffered from a cardiac arrest and that they were so afraid that they were literally scared to death. As Navarro comes in, as she's found the location of Oliver, and they head that way. As we wrap up this episode, and before they meet Oliver, was it just me, or is this the same guy that we met at the very opening of the show, the same guy that was in the scene with the caribou? Now Liz and Navarro go into this man's house without permission as he threatens to shoot them. Now he asks who Navarro is and not who she is as far as a state trooper, but what is her name? What is her ties to her heritage as he mentions that she must have just forgotten? Again, another example of how some of the natives have this personal kind of disrespect towards Navarro. Now in this scene, Oliver is shocked to learn what happened to the scientists, but he only mentions Lun and not the others. He eventually forces them out, but again, I know Lun is the one that that runs the facility, but why was he the only one that he mentioned? It seemed like there was some type of importance behind that. I definitely think that Oliver knows more of what actually happened to them. As Liz gets the call that Lun is awake. Now we learn that he's lost his eyesight. He's acting very aggressive. As we see, Liz doesn't have much time to talk to him because he's going in and out. Now she asks him the important question, what actually happened when they were on that ice? He tells her that they woke her and now she's out in the ice. Now, was he referring to Annie? Is this the town legend or is this something attached to the spirals? He tells her, Who's out there? She came for us. In the dark. <laughs> As there's a commotion going on outside and there was an accident on the police search, Navarro is told to watch over Luns while Liz tries to stop this fight going on outside. As we see him rising up and says, Hello, eventually. Your mother says hello. She's waiting for you. And he points and goes back down and he eventually dies. Now a couple things I want to point out about this scene. Number one, you notice that a spiral is missing from Lund's head. And one would say once he arrived to the hospital and once he went under for a surgery, they probably cleaned him up and removed it. But as I mentioned in last week's breakdown, I feel like the symbol was maybe a protection and once it was removed, he ended up dying. Now you also notice that his voice changed when he was talking to Navarro. Now I wonder if this message came from Navarro's father. I know in the comments some of you all feel that everything that's going on that's supernatural has a logic. It can be scientifically explained, but how the hell do you explain this? 
We all know that Navarro has a family history of her mother and her sister being able to communicate with the dead, and we see that Navarro is starting to have those type of communicational skills with the dead, whether it was the polar bear, the necklace, or the boy in this very episode. I think that Navarro does have the ability to speak to the dead, but she just refuses to kind of channel in that energy. But going back to what Rose said in episode two, I believe that Ennis is the perfect location where the dead and the living can coexist. As our final scene shows, Peter has cracked the phone of Annie and shows Navarro and Liz the last video on her phone. As we see Annie saying that she found it, it's here, something makes a noise in the background, grabs her, and we see her being pulled off the screen. Now, I could be wrong, but as she drops the phone, and if you look at this image here, is that the spiral? Now, we remember this phone was found in Clark's trailer. Was he with Annie when she was under attack? Was that Clark? Was that something else entirely? But also in this scene, where was Annie? Is this what the scientists have been looking for? We all know the scientists were looking for something old and ancient, and we know that this was funded by the Tuttle family. Is it connected to the murders of season one and three? What did Annie find, and who did the scientists find alive? And there's nothing except us. We're here, Navarro, okay, alone. The dead are gone. But are they really gone? Are these characters really alone? A question put to the test in this episode. As it is time for us to discuss and break down episode 4, part 4 of True Detective, Night Country. We open with such a great transition into the HBO logo having that TV white noise into Liz using the sound to try to sleep, something we saw last week as a way for her to try to focus. Now Liz can't sleep and she finds herself replaying Annie Kay's last video. Now she pauses it and notices what we later find out to be whale bones on the wall of this cave. Now Liz goes to check in on Leah who's now sleeping and again right as she watches something or looks at a picture of Annie Kay or watches this video in this case, making the connections that she sees a little bit of Annie K and Leah and she doesn't want to what happened to Annie K happen to her. But I do find it so interesting to see Liz being somewhat kind to Leah, but it's when she's asleep because almost every interaction we see between the two characters have been confrontational. Why doesn't she show this kindness when she's awake and when they're present? As this moment to me set the tone and really set the theme of this episode, focusing on these characters' loved ones growing apart or distant and feeling alone and, unfortunately, one of our characters having to lose what matters the most. As we continue to hear the screams of Annie Kay, which is very important to this episode, transitioning into December 24th, the seventh day of night. As the 48 hours have ended, Peter fills Liz in on the bodies being taken away and Conley is here to supervise it, but Liz is distracted as she notices Jules is in the middle of the street and taking off her clothes and appears to be having a breakdown. As Liz tries to help her by putting a jacket over her but gets elbowed in the face, but she manages to help her out, this is yet another example of Liz being caring towards others. Now this week's end credit shows a peek into a very important location with footsteps leading to somewhere that will change the trajectory of this show later in this episode. Now Navarro is with her sister at the station as Jules apologizes to Liz. We also see Navarro thanks Liz as Liz tells her about the news about Conley being here. Now Navarro is worried about the case being taken away from them as Navarro wants to discuss Annie Kay's video with Liz a little bit later. I gotta admit, it's really nice seeing a sincere moment between them as Navarro puts her hand on Liz's arm, really showing that they don't really hate each other as it was presented in the first two episodes of this season. She was really appreciative of her looking out for her younger sister. Now at the rink, we see Peter observing the bodies being taken away. Now I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's a really quick scene, but this look he gives, is this one of disappointment thinking that the case is now out of their hands? Or is this a look of concern that can maybe be more complex because of the discussion about Peter somewhat being involved is becoming more of a possibility. As we see Navarro in the car with his sister, and while there's no words here, you can see Jules shaking her head and what one would assume is the moment that she agrees to go to the lighthouse. Now back at the station, Peter's found some records of a similar case and with the same injuries as the sciences, as we see Conley is here to talk to Liz. Now he notices that Peter's being very efficient in this case as Liz jokes about him being good regardless of his genetics as Conley tells her that he'll be sticking around for a while but he promises that he won't take away her case but he is here because you have protests around the mine you had a shooting that ended in a fight in the hospital you got six dead bodies in the local ice rink and a still missing person of interest you need to get the shit under control 
Now, Liz jokingly sees this as a way for him to look good for his mayor campaign as they share a few laughs and it looks like their last interaction is now water under the bridge. Now, Liz tells him how the scientists died before they froze and he doesn't want to hear how she knows those details as she's now treating this like a murder case. Now, he tells Liz to keep the video of Annie Kay under wraps for now for any possible connections. Now, last time we saw Connolly, I suspected that maybe he's in Kate's pocket, but after this scene and this episode in general, I think he might be one of the good guys, at least it looks that way for now, but we'll be discussing more about him a little bit later as we cut to Navarro and Jules at the lighthouse where she's checking in. As they both say their goodbyes for now, but unfortunately unknown to Navarro, this is her last time that she'll be seeing her sister alive. Now I couldn't help but to make the connections to this goodbye and how Rose didn't know that she was saying goodbye to Travis, but also how both of those characters both end up dying. This was a really emotional moment between the sisters as Navarro says she knew that she was going to end up here at some point, kind of alluding to maybe Jules having a vision or a dream as we see Jules continues to say her sorries. Now we head back to the station as Peter shows Liz a similar case file to the sciences and the individual goes by the name of Otis. Now his incident took place back in 1998. He was a German local with no records of employment, credit cards, or bank accounts. It almost seems like he's a ghost. No registered address for the past eight years. So no wife, no kids? Nope. It's like no trace, like Oliver de Gock. Now, Otis shares a lot of similarities with Oliver in regards to his records, but his record actually shows more of disorderly conduct. He was a thief, he's been in and out of rehab, and he was last picked up two months back, and there's no cause to his accident. Now for me, there seems to be some connection between Otis and Oliver, and right now it being, why don't they have identifications or any records on them? It makes me wonder why Otis came to Ennis and again the similarities between him and Oliver and not having any records. Were they maybe test subjects? Did Oliver lie to Susan about his position? There's just so many questions but also so many similarities between these two characters. Now with the other officers looking for Clark and Hank picking up his fiance and with it being Christmas Eve, this doesn't matter to Liz as she has Peter figuring out how to find Otis. As Navarro calls Liz to talk about Annie Kay's last video, she mentions that there's no ice caves anywhere near where Annie Kay's body was found. Now this was exactly what I mentioned in my trailer breakdown. As Liz says, Send a message. You said it. Now Navarro mentions that the bones on the wall might be fossils, which sparked my memory to when we saw that file on Clark and remembering that he specializes in the study of microorganisms associated to prehistoric material. So it begs the question, did Clark find something prehistoric? Now like Liz, Navarro could care less that it's Christmas Eve as Liz has a plan. As we cut to the airport where Hank is here to finally meet his fiance as he watches all the passengers exit the plane and surprise surprise, no fiance on board. Now I've mentioned it in the past, but I'm just curious on where their storyline is going because right now it seems to be that he was catfished and that he was taken advantage of and sending this girl money. And is it to show us that he's incapable of being like a mastermind behind the scientist's death, but as well as Annie Kay's death? What's the point of having us have this be shown in the story? We'll talk about it a little bit more, but as of right now, the episode is kind of presenting Hank in a different light and making us kind of feel sympathetic for him. As Navarro and Liz talk about Jules and how she always likes to pray, and this brings Liz to sharing a story about how her dad would say that they should pray with all their hearts before their mother died. We learned that when she prayed as a kid, she prayed so much that it actually hurt her knees as they share a laugh and Navarro jokes that maybe Liz didn't pray hard enough. And this really to me shows and explains how Liz at a very younger age kind of had to disbelief in God after her experience of God not responding to helping her mother before she died. Now Liz's plan is to talk to Bryce and we see that his wife answers the door and she isn't happy that Liz is there obviously because of their past as they show him this video and they need his help to identify what exactly are these images found in this video. Now Bryce does confirm that the bones on the wall were indeed prehistoric and they come from wells as he tells them about the ice cave systems but they're known as a death trap. After a ton of accidents, it was shut down. As he details how dangerous it is going by themselves and that they probably need a guide, but with it being a holiday, it'll probably take a while before they get their maps. But he provides them with a person who can help. 
and that person ended up being Otis, who was responsible for mapping out the caves. As it's starting to all kind of come together, maybe he found whatever or whoever this woman is that is prehistoric that is now awake, and this is exactly what the scientists were looking for, but the only difference is Otis survived. Now we cut over to Jules who's settling into the lighthouse as she's looking to be going to bed and an orange out of nowhere comes from under the bed and rolls in front of her and we start to hear whispers. As she looks under the bed, she finds a woman who's staring directly at her and it appears to be her mother as she notices the necklace. Now if we continue to use Rose's handbook of the dead, what is it that her mother's trying to do? Is she trying to send her a message or, as we find out later, was this the dead trying to force Jules to take on her own life? But again, speaking to the importance of that orange that we got introduced to last week and we know that are in the opening credits of the show, what is the connection of the orange? As I mentioned in my last video, I'm assuming that this orange has some connection to their mom, but what is it exactly that's important about this orange? Now we head back to the station where Hank is obviously disappointed to not find his fiance as he pulls out the alcohol. Now his son Peter catches him and they have a little bit of a conversation. Hank tells him that he believes that his fiance was at the airport because it had to do something with her mother and that her cell phone service is down. Now very important here, Peter asks him if his dad gave her money. Now Hank just glances over that question, he ignores it, and he ends up saying that now that he has all this free time, maybe that he can spend more time with his family during Christmas Eve. Again, seeing this nicer side of Hank and him being what seems to be catfish or scam, is it all a misdirect? Now going down this rabbit hole with me, what if Peter set this all up? What if all the years of possible abuse from his dad, he came up with this plan to embarrass him by making up this fake woman and making him send his money for all these years? Or, let's go even deeper down this hole, Hank is involved in the cover up of Annie Kay's death and Peter knows about it and he's getting revenge by doing this and he's a part of this plan that might speak to the supernatural. I know this is crazy, but again, I don't know where this fiance angle is going so it's making me come up with these crazy theories. Now we see Navarro paying Rose a visit and we notice that Rose is all dressed up for the holidays. Now remembering that the last time we saw her was back in episode two when she dropped the big Russ and Travis connection. So I was excited to see what she has for us this time around. As Rose has prepared a huge feast and we see Navarro questions who she was before Alaska and Rose not being her real name. Now Rose claims that she used to be a professor with very serious ideas. Now one day she just had enough of her life and she decided to just drop everything because she felt like it was meaningless. I find it very interesting that she used these words of meaningless and walking away because this is the exact same conversation that we saw between Liz and Navarro when Navarro asked her if she ever felt like just dropping everything and walking away. But again, this to me continues the narrative, whether it be Otis or Oliver and others going to this town to escape or being at a place where they can disappear. Now she says that she enjoys this quiet lifestyle, well, except from hearing from the dead, which this very topic was discussed on my last after show, which is, is Rose actually dead? And Navarro being the only character that she's spoken to. Now, I personally don't believe that Rose is dead because when we first met her, we saw her alone with that wolf and then she saw Travis. Why would the show go out of its way to show us a dead person or a ghost talking to another ghost? But let's play this out for a second, the whole Rose being dead theory. Remember the conversation about Jules in episode two between Navarro and Rose. As the conversation about the lighthouse was brought up from Rose and her saying not to confuse the spiritual with the mental health almost suggesting that Jules should seek out help. So was that a message from the dead of taking her to the lighthouse, setting her up to end up taking her own life? Again, I'm not in the camp, but there are some signs there that prove that Rose might be dead. And I can't ignore this, look what Rose is wearing. Is this the devil in a red dress? Also, this big supper almost set up like a last supper. So let me know in the comments, do you all believe Rose is dead or alive and Navarro is the only one that communicate with her? Let me know your thoughts on all this in the comments below. As Liz receives a call from Kate telling her to come to the mines immediately. As we see that the mine has been violated with some spray painting saying murderers with the same face tattoo that we've seen on the natives faces before. Now Kate finally arrives and she wants to know what Liz is going to do about this as Liz plans to head home first with the be in the holidays and she'll send some guys out to remove this before the employees return from the holidays. But 
Kate's got a different plan, and that is she wants to press charges. Now Liz responds by immediately saying no, and she goes on by saying that she doesn't need to do this to piss Liz off and ruining her daughter's life because of what happened to them in the past. Now with it being Christmas and the holidays and Liz saying the magic word, which is please, we see Kate decides to let Leah go. Now, if we stick with the idea of Kate being involved in Anne and Kay's murder, why let Leah go without any consequences seems to be a little bit odd for me, or is she allowing her to go free just for now? As we see Navarro calling her sister to check in, and we see Navarro tells her that she'll be seeing her in the morning to celebrate Christmas, as Jules takes a moment to tell her sister how much she loves her. Now we clearly see that Jules is not in her room, but instead she's at that same abandoned boat that we saw her at last week as she removes all her clothes and she folds them as she walks into the cold darkness of the night. Now while we didn't spend a ton of time with Jules, I found the scenes between the two sisters made this moment really get me in the feels. But now let's take a moment to break down this scene. Now we discussed the orange maybe being a sign from the other side or a warning from their mom as we know that that was something that happens to Navarro last week with the orange and now it happens to Jules in this episode. But I want to focus on the removing of the clothes. The scientists were found nude and later Oliver removed his clothes as well and now we see the same thing happening to Jules. Now we can clearly see her eardrums weren't burst and her eyes weren't burnt out but the part of the clothes, is it some type of ritual when one comes encounter with the dead or for those that think that this might be a hallucination, is there some ties to the clothes being removed? But also, going back to last week's episode, it was almost as if Jules predicted this very moment, or in the case of the show, 24 hours ago, she spoke of a man coming and she said that the sea and the water has some bad things going on. Did she envision her drowning in a dream or vision? And is there something important about this abandoned ship and maybe this location being particular to the story? And again, going back to my connections between Jules and Travis, they both drowned in the sea, which makes me wonder if there's ties to both characters and how they died. But also, like Rose having the visits from Travis, will Navarro now see her sister from the dead and her sister giving her clues like Travis did with the scientists being found? I do want to point out that there is a shot of Jules in the main trailer of the show that hasn't been seen yet in this series. So I wonder if that scene was cut and maybe it was a scene right before Liz found her or will we see that scene later in this season? Now back with Liz, we see that Leah is leaving and Liz kind of half ass tries to keep her from leaving but she doesn't try hard enough as Leah decides to leave. Again, I feel like the Leah plot is somewhat affected by the six episode format because we really haven't spent that much time with her and her emotions. But more particularly, the fact that there wasn't any consequences to her being charged seemed like a missed opportunity. And again, it feels like we're skipping scenes and skipping moments from season two as ultimately again, she decides to leave with Kayla. Now for copyright reasons, I'm not gonna play the song, but listen to the lyrics of the song playing during this scene, which is Everybody Dies by Billie Eilish, a song that she herself explained her feelings surrounding death and the idea of one day losing the people that she loves. Now carefully listen to the song in the moments of not being alone, but I'm gonna put it on the screen now, which is verse two of the song, which doesn't play in the episode, but if you read this or listen to the song its entirety, it's Billie Eilish talking about death directly, as it seems that she's talking about a scientific belief of figuring out a way to live forever. That being in the line here, a couple hundred years, what if science may be able to discover a way to avoid death altogether? Now tying that lyric in this song plan to the show, were the scientists or the people controlling the minds looking for a way to live forever? Now we see Liz is playing back Clark's video and notices a similarity in Annie Kay's video as she calls Navarro and tells her that the power went out in both videos. But the question is, why do you have power in an ice cave? As Liz puts it that it might be Oliver since he was the supervisor or manager of the equipment. As we see Liz is slightly drunk and she's not in any condition to question Oliver as she has Peter pick up Navarro. As we cut to seeing Peter and Hank leaving the station, only to find Liz calling Peter as she tells him she wouldn't be calling if only she needed him and he follows the orders. Now we head over to Oliver's place where we see Navarro kind of takes after Liz as she enters without being welcome as it appears that he's been gone since the last time they were there. 
Now, Peter points out, but he doesn't say it directly, but I would assume that the feeling that he was referring to was the same feeling that they had when they first found the scientists. As we see that Oliver has taken off his clothes, again, I point out the scientists were nude, Jules was nude, and now Oliver, and we see that he left his clothes in the same position when he was holding a gun when Navarro and Liz was last there. As she finds a spiral on the floor, but she also finds a stone with the same mark. As they head outside with people awaiting, they find out that he left shortly after they last paid him a visit. As she asks them what the symbol on the stone means, as we see the dogs kind of react to that in a negative way, as they're not welcome to stay and ask questions. I think that they know what's going on, but they're just not willing to tell them it might be because of superstition. We see Liz is upset. She heads over to Connolly's as they get ready to do another not doing this again session. We learn that Connolly sent her to Ennis because she was a better cop than him, but she was just terrible with people. But he also tells her that he sent her here because of what happened to Jake and Holden made things worse for her. Now, this is obviously a buzzkill for Liz as she ultimately leaves. Now, I know I mentioned Conley being a good guy early in this episode and him not maybe being in Kate's pocket, but the mentioning of him running for mayor was mentioned twice in this episode. It seems to be very important. It makes me keep one hand on the wheel of Kate or the powers that be telling him to keep things under wraps with Annie Kay or even the scientists. And if he keeps his mouth shut, maybe they'll give him this position of power, which is him being the mayor. As we cut to seeing Navarro getting a call about Jules, as she doesn't show any emotion in front of Peter, and she tells him to go be with his family, as she just lost the only family member that she had left, and she has this feeling of loneliness that washes over her. Now at Peter's house, he apologizes to Kayla, but she doesn't want to hear it, as we see the literal space between them in this relationship, as he says that why does she just say to him that he ruined her life and she didn't want to have this baby? As I mentioned in my last breakdown, these characters slowly losing the ones closest to them. We have Navarro to Jules, Liz to Leah, and now Kayla to Pete. As we see Navarro driving in rage, and she happens to see that same guy that she arrested back in episode one, as she storms into the lighthouse and questions why did they let Jules leave. As we see that they didn't even know she was missing because it's a voluntary type of position, as Navarro lets her anger completely out as she starts to throw items from the front desk on the ground. Now she heads out of the lighthouse and she starts a fight with those guys, or that one guy in particular, and the rest of the guys kind of jump in as they beat her up. Now, obviously, she's upset about losing her sister, but to me, in this moment, she's getting into this fight to feel something other than grieving, and she wants to replace it with anger and pain. Now, speaking of that same type of frustration and anger, we cut to Liz, who's dealing with the same type of situation with this case, but also Leah, as she's driving under the influence, and out of nowhere, she sees that same exact polar bear that's missing the eye and drives off on the side of the road. Mind you, we haven't seen this polar bear since episode one, as he stares at her and walks away. As to me, this is yet another example of the dead trying to communicate with the living, and it's just as important as the oranges to Navarro. Which, speaking of, cut to Kavik finding Navarro cleaning her wounds as she's lost a tooth and she's joking about you have to see what happens to the other guys. Now, I assume they beat her up and just walked away, but is there a slight chance that she might have killed those guys? I mean, it's a slim possibility, but we find out later in this episode that most likely points to the fact that she was the one that killed Wilder and the man who abused a woman and ended up killing his girlfriend. We know that that guy hit his girlfriend and maybe Navarro killed him and the others. Again, very unlikely. I just wanted to bring it up as a possible possibility. But bringing it back to the scene, we see that one of her fingers appears to be dislocated as she drops the rock with the spiral on it. And I want you all to remember that for later but bringing it back to those lyrics earlier Navarro mentions all the people she comes across including Kavik being alone as he tells her that she's not now he takes advantage of this moment and distracts her by pretending to take their relationship to the next level but he actually uses this moment to put her finger back in place but after losing her sister after losing his fight she takes this moment to let out all her tears now we cut to christmas day which is the eighth day of night where liz has a dream about holden which is cut with showing a graveyard which i would assume where both jake and holden are being held as she's awakened by the door as is navarro now, Navarro tells Liz about Oliver, and she realizes that she misplaced the stone, which I wonder if her leaving that stone back at Kavik's place will have any meaning. Will he end up being hurt because of it being there? 
As Liz accidentally drops a box and Navarro goes to help and she picks up that polar bear, which she remembers from when she passed out and had her vision, where Holden's last thing that he said to her was tell his mom. As Liz immediately shuts down any chance that Navarro has connections to the dead. I don't know what weird ass shit you're thinking. Stop it. Dead people are dead. No heaven. There's no hell. There's no ghosts. Somebody out there just waiting for us, watching us. As Liz throws the bear outside and she says, There's nothing except us. We're here, Navarro. Okay, alone. The dead are gone. She leaves Navarro to telling her what happened to Jules. Now we learn that Jules did drown herself. And again, remembering the last words in last week's episode about her being afraid of the water in the sea. But I found it so interesting that Navarro said that Jules' body is coming later today. Her dead body. Now, obviously, take that on face value, but later she literally comes face to face with her dead body. And Navarro herself have a vision about what's going to happen a little bit later. As Navarro goes over all the things that Jules was diagnosed with, as she says, it takes them one by one as she's referring to her family's curse. First it was their mom, now it's Jules, and she believes that she's next because something has been calling to her as she says she's calling. Now Liz takes this moment to bring up what happened with Wheeler as she says that she saw something in the room with them that day. As we actually cut to the scene and we see the dead girl is pointing at her and it's the same point that her mother did to her when she was younger, also the same point that Lund did, but notice the eyes, but more importantly, the scream is almost identical to the same scream in Annie Kay's video, and it's the same scream that we're about to hear in a second. Is this some type of calling from the dead, or is it from the town's legend, who we haven't heard about since episode one? But it's important to note, we still haven't really actually saw what happened to Wheeler, and it seems to be that Navarro was the one that shot him, but again, Liz being the one that might have done it after hearing that song that we know that he was whistling, a song that we know that haunts her. As Peter calls Liz and shares a photo with her about a man who appears to be Clark in Annie Kay's jacket. As they head to the drenches, which is a good place to hide, a place that used to be beautiful, but after a while... Not abandoned. Still out there rotting. Forgotten. Are we all? Now as we wrap up this episode, we see Liz and Navarro head inside, and they find a message that says, keep off the grass, but then they also see this drawing here, which to me looked to be a large creature or a large spider from a Lovecraft country story. I'm no expert, so comment below on your thoughts on what that creature might have been, because it's not the same thing that Darwin drew back in episode one, and I don't remember seeing this drawing in Clark's trailer, but the eyes were something that stood out to me. Maybe it's the same eyes that we've seen from the dead or the sciences. Is this the one who's now awake? As they also find the spiral symbol as someone above them starts to run away. Now Liz goes after them and Navarro hears something call to her and she looks down and she sees that Jules' body is floating in the water below. Remember the message from Lund last week where he told her that she's waiting for her. Is this connected to that moment? Now Navarro follows and finds footsteps, but back with Liz, she chases this person as they stand in a corner and reveal themselves to be Otis. Now Liz sees that there's drugs on the floor and she asks him where he got the jacket from. Now back with Navarro, she heads towards music playing from the Christmas tree with presents underneath. Now remember, this is exactly what she promised her sister and what they would do on Christmas as she turns around and sees her dead sister Jules, who's screaming at her, again, the same scream that I mentioned earlier, which appears to be a scream from the dead. As Otis tells Liz that Clark is gone and he went back to hide as he's hiding in the night country. Now Liz goes back to Navarro and she seems to be in some type of gaze as we see her eardrums are bleeding just like the scientists. As it seems to be some type of effect after you hear the screams from the dead. You're all in the night country now. What did Otis mean when he said that we're in the night country now? Where exactly is the night country? Is that his way of saying that the dead is now with them? As we learn more about the logical reasoning behind the scientist's death, we get more insight on what the night country is, and we see yet another character lose someone from their family, but this time by their own hands. As it is time for us to discuss and break down episode 5, part 5 of True Detective Night Country.
as it is December 31st, the 14th day of night, which marks our first time jump of the show, which is six days between this episode and the last. We open with the cremation of Jules, which I thought it was just such a great creative choice to not have any music during this scene as we just hear the sounds and we watch the scene play out. It just made it feel so personal. From seeing her bones and her skull become ash, to seeing her name and her birthday and time of death, to the ashes going to the urn, all while her sister Navarro watches this as she ultimately holds her sister for the last time. Now don't get me wrong, as I mentioned in my last video and I'll mention it now, I feel bad for these characters involved, but I can't help but to think this would have been so much more impactful if we would have spent more time with Jules individually, number one, but also between Jules and Navarro. Now we discussed this in my last after show, but I feel like the six episode format to me has definitely affected some of these characters and their arcs and their story, and Jules to me is one of them. As this week's opening credits last shot shows a SUV parked in a location near the mines where a very important meeting will be taking place. You see that Liz did take Otis with them after finding him in the last episode as he's now in the hospital. Now he's going through withdrawals and Liz only has 10 minutes to question him and is told to take it easy on him. Now Liz's first question is if he knew Clark from before. As he says, he knew of the research lab, but he didn't know of the men. Now what did Clark want with Otis? He wanted to know how he survived his injuries, which Otis points out the way he looks doesn't look like he really survived. Now my question is, why did Clark want to know about how he managed to survive? Was he preparing to perform a similar act to himself and the scientists and wanted to make sure they didn't survive? Or maybe Clark's potential involvement with the scientists, maybe he figured out a way to survive the effects. As Liz questioned where is Clark's location now, as Otis doesn't recall telling Liz that he was in the night country, which one would blame the drugs for his response back in episode 4, or maybe he was possessed like Lund back in episode 3. As Otis mentions that Clark was crazy and he would say that she's awake and that he has to hide because she's out there. As Liz questions what happened to Otis back in 1998. Otis tells her a story about a cave-in and a man who died after being trapped in the ice after a blizzard, which I'm very curious if that's a similar blizzard to what we see later in this episode. As Otis and the others went to help, but he heard something. Something screaming and hollering and the other man with him followed this sound. Almost reminds me of those stories in the myth legend of what you hear about men being tricked into following the sounds of sirens. But also that scream that he mentioned is that a similar scream to what we've heard several times throughout this season. Now Otis claimed that he went after these men but nothing happened. He can't recall what happened next except that he found himself in the hospital with those injuries. Now we know that Otis obviously has a history with being in and out of rehabs and being a drug addict so my question is do you all believe him? And again why was he the only survivor and what exactly happened to those other men? As Liz pulls out a map to find the location in Annie's video as he points it out, now he warns her how dangerous it is, especially without a guide, but Liz tells him he'll be joining them soon as he's recovered. But he tells her that he can't go like this, implying that he needs drugs and he wants Liz to get those drugs. Now Liz refuses at first, but he tells her that her time is up and there's a look on Liz's face and we all know as an audience, we've seen Liz break the rules in order to solve cases. As we cut to seeing Navarro arrive in the pick up Liz as Liz notices the yearn in the back and she wants to know if Navarro wants to talk about it, which she doesn't. Now back at Peter's house, we see Kayla has packed up his bags with clothes and tells him to not come back she wants him to leave. Peter says that this is wrong because this is his family too, as this to me sets the stage for yet another character losing their family because of this case, as Peter will later lose another member permanently. Now I've mentioned this before, but I feel like the Peter and the Kayla relationship kind of falls in the same camp with Jules and we'll talk about with Leah. The supporting characters feel kind of underdeveloped and this is a perfect example of this, like every time we We've seen scenes between Kayla and Peter, it feels like we're jumping right into the middle of the conversation. To me, it just feels rushed seeing them having this conflict in the middle of their relationship because logically speaking, there is a crime that needs to be solved. There were people murdered or potentially murdered and I just don't understand this pushback from Kayla because it seems like the show just presented it as Peter's just staying overnight for this particular case. This isn't a recurring thing. So again, just let me know if you all are feeling the same that the scenes between Kayla and Peter just feel a little underdeveloped and it doesn't feel as organic as the other stories. Now back with Liz and Navarro, they're heading over to the cave which happens to be on the property of the Silver Lion Mines. As Navarro asks about Leah and she tells her that Leah is becoming one of those crazy radicals but just when Navarro is going to correct her we hear Liz does acknowledge how much they've been affected by everything going on with the mines. Which speaking of Leah we actually cut over to her and her girlfriend as they put face paint on in preparation of a rally. 
Now back with Liz and Navarro, they arrive to the location, and as they arrive, they see that the entrance is blocked off. As Navarro points out, a course is blocked off, implying that the mines had something to do with this. Now in frustration, we see her head back to the car. As you would imagine, every time they take two steps forward, they take six steps back because of the mines. Now back with Peter, he's now at his dad's house and hoping that he can stay after being kicked out, as he notices his dad singing and playing the guitar. Now remembering back in episode 2, the scene between him and Leah, he told her a story about hearing that his dad actually played the guitar, but he never got to see that side of his dad, well, until now, as he sits outside and listens. Now if you listen to the lyrics, they seem to have importance to this character Hank, as he talks about there being no God, which we know that a lot of these characters don't believe in God, he talks about hollow ground, maybe he's referring to the legends of the night country, but more importantly, he sings about being bound to losing, a king who won't be crowned, there are no stars, she's falling down and being lost. Is this Hank saying that he feels like he's lost? To me, Hank knew he was falling down this path where he knew he was not going to be able to come back from, especially after we learned what he did with Annie Kay in the cover-up. He didn't get the position he wanted. He didn't get the girl he wanted. Hank is desperate and is soon about to lose his son and his own life. So to me, this was foreshadowing to what's going to happen later to this character. Now, while this was playing, we see the protesting happening and things begin to get out of hand as we see that the squad cars are arriving with Navarro being with them. As we cut to the riot, we see Navarro in action as she sees Annie Kay in the crowd staring at her and we hear those same whispers we've heard before whenever we have Navarro kind of zoning out and we see that she kind of quickly disappears. Now correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but this is the first time we've seen her have a vision with Annie Kay, which to me means that these spirits seem to be getting closer and their presence seem to be getting closer to Navarro as well. Now we see Navarro getting hit in the head and she turns around and finds out that it's Leah, who she is quickly grabbed by the head from an officer who hits her in the back. Now Leah calls out to her girlfriend Sherry as she just looks at her and run away, which I think is safe to assume that we probably won't be seeing Sherry in next week's finale. As Navarro steps in to help Leah, we see that she gets into a full out fight with that officer. Cut to Liz on the phone with Connolly who's talking about the protest and that Kate is furious and wants Liz in her office and he'll be in attendance. And at the same time, Navarro calls Liz about what happened to Leah. Now in the car, these two characters share their first scene together as Leah wonders which side Navarro's on. As Leah presses Navarro about not being more involved in what's going on in town, we see Navarro telling Leah the bad news, which is that Liz wants her locked up. Now to have a brief conversation about Leah, I hate to say it, but at first Leah and her wanting to get involved with the protest I can get behind all of that stuff and I get it her being a teenager and we've all been teens and we've experienced our rebellious tendencies and our rebellious side but everything else about this character is quite frankly annoying. I think last week for me was a straw that broke the camel's back with her not acknowledging how Liz got her off from getting charges pressed against her and just her attitude in this episode just continues to be just annoying characteristics. This isn't a critique towards the acting but more of the writing of the character. Again, an example of this six episode format hurting a supporting character in their story and their arc. It just makes some characters feel very one dimensional and Leah to me is one of those characters. Now back at the station, Liz beelines to Peter questioning if he knew about Leah going to the protest, which he didn't know because as he tells her, he just recently got kicked out of his own house as Liz shows some sympathy and asks if he needs a place to stay. Now Peter's got some good news for Liz and just as he's telling her that, in comes Leah. Now, my personal opinion, I actually feel like Liz is doing the right thing by putting Leah in a jail cell just for a little bit because tensions are high, there's a potential human killer out there or supernatural entity out there and also everything going on with Kate. So I personally think that was the right decision to have Leah kind of locked up for a little bit. Let me know how you all feel about that. But as far as the good news goes, Peter tells her more about the LLC situation involving the Tuttle Company which we know is the same company involved in the murders of season one of True Detective. As he tells her that the Tuttles actually own the mines, which officially ties them directly to the scientists. As Liz points out, the mine bankrolls the researchers and in exchange, they make up these bogus pollution numbers as Liz is starting to realize that this is all connected and that maybe the situation going on is much bigger than she can ever imagine. 
Now, for me, knowing what the Tuttle family was capable of in season one of True Detective and their connections to that spiral, it's important to make the point that the minds want to fund the research that involved the stopping of decay of the body or the origins of life, which adds more fuel to the fire that the Tuttle family and the powers that be are in the search of immortality or a way to escape death. Now, again, bringing it back to season one of True Detective and knowing that the Tuttle family and their connections to the spiral was their belief was was that their victims are actually sacrifices to get them closer to the cosmic being known as the Yellow King. Now fast forward 15 years later, maybe they had the scientists experimenting on the discovery of immortality and finding a way to get to the Yellow King, but then they failed because it may only work for certain people. Again, connecting this to Setna, who I previously mentioned in my last video, the goddess of the sea, as she resides as the ruler of the underworld, aka the night country. So I'm wondering, did the Tuttle family and the scientists, did they find the night country? But things just went terribly wrong. Now we get this scene between the characters Leah and Peter as Leah talks about how Kayla told her the story how she fell in love with Peter and she points out the man that he used to be or at least the man that she fell in love with as we see Leah telling Peter to not let Liz take that away. Because as Leah puts it, she's not good with people that she cares for which to me was foreshadowing to what happens later in this episode. We cut over to Navarro questioning if Leah is really going to be locked up by Liz as they have a conversation about how Liz covered for Navarro yet again about the the fight that she got in with another trooper which to me is just more proof that Liz has a habit of covering up for Navarro as Liz shows Navarro the paperwork that Pete found as she leaves to go to talk to the captain and Kate. Now at this meeting, Liz first thing is she wants to address that the protest had nothing to do with her department as she goes right into what she found but Kate cuts her off and has Connolly step in to show her something. Now before we further break down this scene, is it just me or is the Silver Sky logo shaped like a star almost similar to the one found on Annie Kay's body? Kate shows Liz footage of her and Navarro on Silver Sky property as Kate questions what led her to this location. Now Liz kind of skates around all the details and tells Kate that it has to do with the case and Clark, but Kate wants to know how she knew about this location as we see her bringing up the engineer. Now to me, I thought this was a mistake on Liz's part to actually say that it was Otis but you can tell once she said Otis there was a look in Kate's face like we thought that we got rid of him which is something we discuss in the after show that I believe that Kate and the Tuttles and the mine company knew that Otis was onto something but they discredited him from being this very probably smart individual that can mine the maps of the caves but after he discovered something again they discredited him and made him become a drug addict. Now Kate tells Liz the news that this isn't a murder case because the results came in and they died because of slab avalanche. As is believed that they wanted to see the sun fall before the long night and they got caught in this avalanche and their injuries were caused because of this accident as we go back to square one and it's said and it's believed that they froze to death. Now I think we can collectively agree that no matter if your team's supernatural or if your team's scientifically based in reality, this smells like BS cover up by the Silver Sky aka the Tuttles. I had to bring this up and some of you all have actually mentioned this back in my episode one breakdown but this is just the icy on the cake as the reasoning is exactly the one used in a diet love pattern incident. Now I'm not going to go into all the details as you all can look it up but back in 1959 what happened to the scientists in the show was very similar to what happened to the hikers back in that time. Now even though this case happened in 1959 there were so many different theories of what happened to these Russian hikers as the case was reopened in 2019 and they said that the possible explanation was a slab avalanche as the possibility of a crime happening was discounted which is the same thing we're seeing in this exact scene. As Liz points out the connection she found and it being a conflict of interest and we get to see just how well Kate's trained to handle situations like this as she kindly takes the documents and says that she'll look into this. Now Liz doesn't hold back in throwing Kate's husband's sexual abilities under the bus as she leaves the room leaving Liz alone with her captain. Now Liz tells him that the location of the Silver Sky Mines is where Annie Kay was killed which links to two cases as he responds by mentioning what happened three years back between Navarro and Liz in the Wheeler case as he tells her there was no murder suicide. Now we find out how he knew about this information a little bit later as we see Liz questions what happened to him simply implying that he used to do more and be more concerned with these unsolved cases as Liz says a woman was murdered. 
Now, Connolly acknowledging the Willer case and saying without saying, walk away, Liz, and I'll keep your secret, but you must keep this case closed. To me, this shows that Connolly's kind of playing both sides as we learn that he was indeed working with Kate later in this episode, but he clearly cares for Liz as he ultimately tells her that this case is closed and to head back home. As it is time for us to find out the importance of the last shot of the opening credits. As we see this secret meeting between Kate and Hank, she immediately asks him how Peter is, and this is the second time we've seen her do this, which on a side note, her asking him that every time makes me kind of think that she's the actual mother of Peter, but also I think in her mind, this is kind of like making small talk and trying to make them appear to be more human and not pretending to be actual murderers. As she tells him that Liz just won't let this case go and looking more into the Annie Kate murder, and she says she can't find that cave. Now Hank tells her he doesn't Know what he could do about that as she suggests letting Otis take her to the caves as Hank says that Connolly should maybe get involved but she lets him know that he's just a political animal implying what I mentioned in my last video which is that Connolly's involved but he doesn't know all the workings within what's going on with Kate and Tuttle as she calls him weak and that she knows that he's sleeping with Liz. As Hank points out that she's broken promises in the past because he was supposed to become the chief of police and that he did something for them. Now Kate tells them that they, and I want to put an emphasis on they, meaning more than Kate being involved in this paying him well, but he says that the money is gone and plan that he spent it all on his online bride. Kate goes on about having no clue that Liz would end up in Ennis, but this time is different as it seems that she might have a little bit more control than before. Now Hank says that he's not a killer, which we'll talk about him not being a killer later. She makes him repeat that she didn't ask him to kill anyone. Her plan for now is for him to hand this without getting her into the details more or less saying by any means necessary as she says if he does this for them he will get the position that he wanted and she's counting on him which to me goes back to the song earlier being bound to losing a lot of things were revealed in this scene as we'll talk about here kate is in on all of this and she did have annie k killed but the question remains who was the one that actually killed annie k we still don't know that at the end of this episode as we also learn that Connolly is involved as a political game but again as i suggested i don't think he knows about the full extent of what the minds are doing i don't even think he knows about annie k's death he might know but again when she said that he's weak and he's a political animal to me apply that he only knows some of the information that's going on on out there in regards to their corruption going on which we also learned that Annie K was indeed killed in the mines that were blocked off but the evidence seems to still be there even after six years we also learned that Hank was paid to cover this up we know that the files were kept at his house and we'll later learn that he had a role in Annie K's murder and lastly Kate wants Liz dead it's important that she dies which puts a target on Liz's back now my question is I'm very curious now how much power does Kate actually have? Is she just a puppet? Is she actually a part of the Tuttle family? I'm very curious to know what the big reveal of Kate's powers are in next week's finale. As we cut to Navarro at the laundromat and as she's getting her uniform out of the washer, she finds this black hair in the washer and it suddenly disappears and we slowly hear some screaming as well as Kayla kind of interrupts and asks if she's okay. Now I've seen the theory online and I've seen it in my comment section as far as Navarro possibly being the killer and we'll be discussing that later in this video but we also have a larger discussion planned for my after show. As we see Kevin has been looking for Navarro and gives her back the stone with the marking found in Oliver's place and he brings Kenny with him as Kenny knows exactly what this spiral means. As Kenny tells Navarro that his grandfather told him to walk away whenever he saw this spiral as people would leave this as a warning for places where the ice would swallow them whole. And just to add cherry on top of this scene, in comes suspicious Blair. I've said it before and I'm going to say it again, I believe Blair has something to do with whatever supernatural forces are involved in this show. As there are underground ice caves, his grandmother was so mad at the kids when they would play with these ice caves because she would say the night country would take them. So now we can put two and two together that the night countries are where the hidden caves are underneath the land, which to me sounds like a local legend similar to the one back in episode one, which I mentioned has ties to Cinda. But I want to talk about Blair briefly and Blair magically appearing in the background. 
I don't think that's a coincidence. To me right now, there seems to be some type of connection with Blair and maybe wanting revenge of what happened to Annie Kay by maybe summoning this goddess with witchcraft and something went terribly wrong. But going back to what the night country is and maybe people consider it a place where the dead live or as some might call it, the underworld. Which not to beat a dead horse, but again, the potential of Cinda connection. She's the ruler of the underworld as it is known that the spirits of the departed have resided in the underworld and it's an extension of itself located underneath the land and the sea. Now I'm not going to go too deep into this because I plan on making a separate video detailing this but Cinda isn't alone in the underground. Not only does she have the spirits of the ones that pass away but there's also an avenging monster who's fixated on people that practice witchcraft and there's also a death god or a demon whose physical form is one of a bear and not just any bear, a polar bear which we've seen multiple times in this show. So again, I beg the question, do you all believe that the supernatural will ultimately be revealed in the finale? Back at the station, Navarro tells Liz about a way to get into the caves and find the highest point in cracking in, but Liz tells her that it's all over. Liz fills Navarro in about the news that the captain gave her and to no longer pursue the mines as Navarro is only concerned about figuring out what happened to Annie Kay as she wants to find the night country but Liz tells her that Conley knows what happened with Willer and if they continue to pursue this more or less he probably will let that information out. Now it's unknown to both characters how Conley knew this about Wheeler, but Navarro isn't taking no for an answer because she has hopes that she'll find evidence to who actually killed Annie Kay. As Liz just begs to her to just let it go, it's time to let this case go as Navarro tells her that she's walking away from Annie Kay who's alone in those caves. This is just as unserved and she tells her that Annie Kay is now on her. Again, for those watching and wondering why is Navarro so hung up on solving this Annie Kay's murder, remember her mother was killed and they never found a killer and to me that was her reasoning why she became a police officer. That was her reasoning why she never wants to accept women getting abused or killed and it's just very personal to her. Which again, the theory out there about Navarro being the one that is the killer and that she might have killed Annie Kay, that to me doesn't line up. The whole split personality thing, I might buy into a little bit, but her being responsible for Annie Kay's death would be a terrible way to handle this character and their motives and their morals. But the idea of Navarro having these blackouts and this causing this other personality to come out and that she was the one that actually killed the scientists and that the dead are the ones that are pointing to her because they are pointing to her to get the next person to kill the next person to do right by the ones that were wrong and maybe just maybe Navarro's indigenous name might be Cinda. The very next scene might have more meaning as Navarro lets Leah go without Liz's permission and she sees this and lets it pass. Navarro releasing Leah may be more symbolic to her releasing whatever spirit is inside of her. This look that she gives Liz, is that Navarro or is this this other personality? As the theme of not picking or choosing your family continues, we see Hank recalling a story of Peter falling through the ice. As Peter almost died during this incident, but his dad actually saved him. But the importance of this scene, why did Hank tell him this? To me, this was him reminding Peter that he's his family. And if things go south with these orders from Kate, he's hoping that Peter will remember that he's family and he literally saved his life at one point and he's hoping that his son will do the same thing for him. As to me, this perfectly tees up the scene that we have later in this episode, which was the blood is bloodline having a payoff. As we see Liz reflecting on what Navarro told her about taking on Annie Kay, which speaking of, we see Rose helping Navarro with putting those ashes in the ice. As Rose says, is there's a big storm coming this way, which I think goes back to that 1998 blizzard that might be coming again to the town. As we see the lights are starting to flicker, Navarro hears whispers and begins walking further onto the ice as we cut to the same location in which we believe that she served in and where we last saw her talking or interacting with Holden, but immediately cuts back to the ice cracking beneath her. As we see Rose ends up saving Navarro and she tells her, did you not hear me calling your name? Are these these blackouts feeding more into the idea that Navarro is the killer? But also this recurring location in the desert, again, associating this with the location to which she once served in the Marines, what exactly was whispered to her that day? Was she the sole survivor of what looks to be like an accident or maybe their truck was under attack, but some spirit kept her safe? This location to me has to be very important to her story and there's something underneath that wants her. 
As Liz Gordon checks on Leah, Leah tells her about the story of the nine mothers who lost their babies in the last few months, as Liz just wants her daughter to be home, as Leah says to her that she hasn't given up on her quite yet. Now, I do want to point out, Leah saying those nine moms, I'm starting to wonder if those nine moms may have summoned the mother of the sea to seek revenge on their fallen children. As we see, Hank is following Liz, who's going to pay a visit to the dead, and she finds out that these are the people that aren't able to be buried quite yet because of the weather. Now, this includes the babies that unfortunately died because of the mines. This, to me, was a great motivational scene for a character, as I think that she used this to continue the case. As I would imagine, she's thinking about those moms who lost their children, and she's also connecting to them because she lost her child in Holden. As she's willing to do anything to solve this case, we see Liz go into the evidence room where she gets the drugs for Otis as we see Hank still following her. As she says to him if he talked to Conley, but she gets no response, but she sees Peter and takes him into her office immediately. Liz questions if Pete talked to Connolly about Wheeler and comes to the conclusion that his dad hacked into his computer to put the pieces together. As Liz forces Peter to ask the right questions, repeatedly telling him that he's not asking the right ones until he says, did you know that Wheeler was left-handed? As he goes into details and tells Liz that he figured out that the files with the Wheeler case were tampered with and that the rest of them went missing, and the real question is, did Liz and Navarro shoot Wheeler and cover it up? This was just such a fantastic scene between these two characters as we see Liz telling him how smart he is, but he needs to learn to stop asking questions. She gives him a place to stay, which is in the back of her house in this extra room in the shack, as Liz has a lot of faith in him that he won't tell anyone of what her and Navarro did involving the Willer case. Tank tries to have a talk with his son, but Peter is clearly upset with him after learning that his dad hacked into his computer, but I also have a suspicion that Peter might be also figuring out that Hank might have been involved in the Annie K murder. As we cut to seeing Liz getting older, she tells him that she's got the drugs in order for him to help, calls Navarro, who's at Kavik's house at this point, but we see this scene here and Kavik kisses her and tells her to come back. That last come back might be more important than we know. What if Kavik is aware of the idea of her having this other persona and what if he is serving as that polar bear demon spirit and they both are involved in the killing of the scientist? Or him saying come back because he knows what happens when she has these blackouts because he's probably witnessed it before and he wants her to come back and not her other side. As we see Otis ultimately does show Liz the high point in exchange for the drugs which we see him go in the bathroom to get high. Now as Navarro heads their way she sees this random kid in the street that points at her but it's it's the exact same point that's been given to her as when she was little with her mom, where we saw Lun point at her, we saw the Wheeler girl point at her. This is so important, but the question is, will Navarro listen to this direction, or has she been following where they're pointing? At Liz's house, we see Hank arrives, and Hank makes up some story about having to take Otis in. Now Liz tries to call Connolly to check in on the story, but at the same time tries to grab her weapon, where we see Hank actually grabs it. Now, Liz is trying to de-escalate the situation, but Otis comes in to see what the commotion is going on, as we see Hank points the gun at him, and he says that he's taking him in, as Hank says that he's going to handle this very similar to what they did with the Wheeler case. As Hank is just ultimately jealous and upset about her taking his kid away, as we see Otis starts to walk away and this is where Hank who I mind you said that he's not a killer we see he shoots Otis twice and ultimately kills him which makes me wonder what he's about to say next was all a lie did Hank actually kill Annie Kay now Peter enters the room and draws his gun on his own dad as Hank needs his son to help him just like he did when he was younger Connecting it to earlier, blood is blood, family is family, as Liz tells Peter to make the right call to just think. As Peter ultimately listens to Liz and chooses his own family, he points his gun at his own dad. Ultimately, picks Liz's side. Now Hank realizes that he's lost his son and he tells the truth about Annie K. Now he tells him that he didn't kill her, but he did move the body. As he says, blood is blood, as Hank is about to shoot Liz, but Peter intervenes and ultimately kills his own dad. Now we see Liz is holding Peter, which goes back to that conversation we had about it being more of a mother-son relationship and this kind of being the replacement that Peter wanted as a mom. But I want to go back to Hank acting as though he's going to shoot Liz. Now I personally think that he wasn't going to shoot Liz I think that Hank knew he was going to die in that moment he knew he lost his son but he also knew that his son was going to pull the trigger on him but also do you all think that he was telling the truth about just moving Annie Kay's body and not knowing if he's the killer or not but I have this feeling that he kicked and he beat up Annie Kay and maybe he was the one that actually cut out her tongue 
As Navarro arrives, we see that the storm is also here, both literally and figuratively, as Liz wants to call Connolly. Now, Navarro tells her that he's involved as well, and she comes up with the plan to get rid of the bodies. As the story's gonna go that Hank got to Otis and he killed him, but when he got rid of the body, he got into an accident. Now, is it me or Navarro coming up with this plan seems to be almost too familiar with her and she jumping right into action, which again goes back to, is this our Navarro? or is this her during one of her blackouts? Now, Navarro wants to use the storm to their advantage, and we see that Peter agrees. As Peter will stay behind and clean, the plan is for him to take this to Rose and have her take him to Julia, aka the ice. As Peter tells Liz to go because this is essentially his literal mess to clean up. But is it me or just like Navarro, Peter's behavior seems off, especially when Navarro says to him, you know what to do. Obviously, he's a police officer. He probably knows how to cover his tracks or... Have Navarro and Peter done this before? As Peter is left to take care of this mess, as we see Navarro and Liz head into the storm to finally put this case to rest. Stories are stories, and we've got one to talk about. As we hear the story about how Annie Kay was murdered, and who or what killed the scientists, as we finally close this case. It's time for us to discuss and break down Episode 6, Part 6, in the season finale of True Detective Night Country. It is December 31st, the 14th day at night. We open this finale with Navarro and Liz finding the right spot to enter the night country. As they give each other a look as if they really want to do this, but also a look of who's going to go down first. As Navarro says screw it and she jumps down, and as soon as she enters, she starts to begin to hear those whispers. As they continue to walk down these caves, we see Liz stops and Navarro says, You feel it too, don't you? Slippery, careful. But yet again, this is an example of seeing Liz refusing to acknowledge that there's something that can't be explained. But that will change later on. As outside, we see that the storm is only getting worse. We see Navarro stops and hears something calling to her. She says that it's here and she heads into this open space as Liz follows. As they reach a dead end, we see Navarro says it's here and Navarro asks if Liz can hear it and she says it's calling out to her and out of nowhere she falls through the ice. Now as Liz is going to get help, she also falls as well. As it appears that they are trapped, they look around and out of nowhere here comes Clark just standing there looking at them as they begin to chase him. As they follow him, they stumble upon what looks to be a working laboratory, but they can't find Clark. As they look around, they look up and see the spiral marking on the ceiling as they know this is the exact spot in which Annie Kay died. As our last shot of the opening credits show a rim of a tire on the floor of the research lab, a very important moment for Liz later in this episode. As Navarro looks for a way out, Liz finds a star-shaped piece of equipment, as we'll later find out this is the same one used to stab Annie Kay. Navarro finds a hidden door that leads to a ladder heading up in which they follow. Now inside, we hear the song Twist and Shout playing, and it almost has this feeling of, for not only the characters, but the audience, we have this sense of deja vu from the first episode, or as Russ Cole and Clark says later in this episode, time is a flat surface and it repeats itself. Meanwhile, back at Liz's house, we find Peter is finishing cleaning up the bloodbath left from last week's finale, as he puts the bodies in his dad's trunk, and he cleans himself as well. Now back at the station, Liz and Navarro have to split up to find Clark, as Navarro Navarro notices wet footprints that lead her to a dead end of a wall. As we watch Liz, who's turning off the music, she hears something and heads back to where they came, only for Clark to trap her inside this locked container. As Navarro hears this noise, she heads that way, only for Clark to knock her out with a fire extinguisher, and he begins to drag her away. Now, did you all notice something about that scene? First off, the footprints Navarro saw led her to where Clark was. I believe it was a sign from the dead and maybe her sister footprints back from episode four. And second, you'll notice that Navarro didn't hear that song twist and shout whenever we got her perspective. It was only Liz that heard that song playing. Again, I believe this was a sign or a message from the dead and I believe this was from her son Holden. This scene right here is very important to note throughout this episode. Both characters having to listen to the messages from the past and facing the things that haunt them head on. Now Liz manages to make it out of this container, but she finds Navarro beating Clark's ass, leaving him unconscious as they realize they're stuck here because of the storm. Now back with Peter, he's seamlessly taking care of most of the mess except he's missed a spot as Leah walks in. 
Now, disappointed to find out that Liz isn't home, Peter has to come up with an excuse of where Liz is and why he's cleaning up this house. We see Peter makes up this excuse of taking her back to his house because he doesn't want Kayla and Darwin to be along for New Year's Eve, in which Leah agrees. It looks like Peter has become a quick learner in lying on his feet from his dad and also Liz. Now, Liz and Navarro manage to wake Clark up, and Navarro's first question to him is if he actually loved Annie Kay, and he says yes. Now, to test this out, we see she plays Annie Kay's last video before dying. As this video clearly upsets him, Navarro tapes her phone to his chest as well as headphones for him to listen and to watch on repeat, in hopes to get him to speak about the truth of what happened in that video and what actually happened to Annie Kay. I don't know about you all, but for any of my movie buffs out there, this moment of Navarro leaving the video with him reminded me of Clockwork Orange as we watched Liz and Navarro leave the room to get some coffee. Now back with Peter, after dropping Leah off, we see Kayla knows something is off and she gets into the car with Peter. She knows that he is lying about something and she even goes as far to say that Liz make you do something wrong. Now in hopes to not make matters worse we see Peter admits to doing something on his own and not because of Liz and he needs to take care of this alone. He says that he has to do this one last thing and after he does this he promises to be fully committed to this family and this relationship. As we see Kayla kisses him and tells him to be safe. For the first time this season it was nice for once that Kayla actually agreed on something that Peter needed or wanted to do. Now since this is the last scene between these characters Characters, I just have to say, I don't blame the actors, but more so the writing and the lack of time spent between them wasn't all that developed. Now, I know on paper, Peter was trying to break the cycle of how he was raised, and I would say that Kayla had a gut feeling that Liz and his job would take him on this path that would be hard for him to return to her and her family, but I just didn't really care for that particular plot. Again, this is just my opinion, but let me know your overall thoughts on this particular relationship between Peter as a father to Darwin, which by the way, we only saw them in two scenes together, and how you felt about him as a husband to Kayla. Now back at Salah in the kitchen, we see Liz and Navarro having a discussion as out of nowhere, she opens the refrigerator and an orange falls at Navarro's feet, remembering the importance of the orange from episode 3 and 4. As she talks about how her mother used to love them and she explains how her mother and Jules used to peel them, which explains why we see the peeling of the orange in the opening credits. As one would imagine that that's been her mother or now after Jules died, trying to reach out to her with this orange, but again, remembering Rose's explanation and her experience with the dead, these moments are signs from the dead, it's a warning for them, but based on how things wrap up in this finale, it's safe to assume that this was from her mother or Jules. Now Liz notices a piece of glass on her shoe and we cut back to that same scene all the way back from episode 1 of her walking on glass from a car accident. Now again, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I just want to stress how important these little details are from the music playing, the wet footprints, the glass, the orange as moments of signs for them both and there's many more to come throughout this episode. As we see Navarro says that Peter might be scarred for life after killing his dad as Liz says tomorrow maybe it's crazy the shit will survive. Now back with Clark, Navarro asks Clark if he was with Annie as he responds that he wasn't there at first. He goes into detail and says that Annie Kay found some notes and pieced together what they were actually doing at the station. As we learn that they were digging for the DNA of a microorganism contained in the depths of the frost that could save the world and they actually cracked it. They were able to do so because of the pollution of the mines helped soften the frost. As they were pushing the mines to push more pollution into the environment, into the water, into the ground to speed up the process and in their minds this was worth the many lives of few in order to save the lives of millions if not billions as we finally see what happened and meet Annie Kay's killers. Now Clark claims that Annie Kay snuck into the Salal station as she was looking for paperwork to connect them to the mines but discovered the truth and immediately started destroying all of their work. Now Clark was awakened to her screams as he ran down to her to find Lund filled with rage stabbing her with that piece of equipment shaped like a star. Now in a panic for her life we see Annie Kay begins to defend herself with another piece of equipment as she hits Clark and she starts swinging at the rest of the scientists who have entered the underground laboratory. As they manage to get the weapon out of her hand, they all gather to stop her and begin to hold her down and allow Lund to finish the job by stabbing her 32 times. Now let's take a look at one of my early theories all the way back from episode 1. Check out this clip. Killed Anne. Now for my movie fans out there, I can't help but to make the connection between what's going on with these scientists and Anne in the amazing film by the name of Wind River. 
Now, without spoiling the movie for those that haven't seen it, which I highly recommend you all watch that incredible movie, I'm starting to think, what if Clark had a relationship with Anne, maybe the scientist did something to her and Clark was forced to keep his mouth closed, or maybe Clark killed Anne himself. Now, this isn't exactly the same situation from that film, which again, Wind River is fantastic and it comes highly recommended for me, but what happened to Annie and those characters involved in that film are very similar. Which makes me feel like I should be a detective for next season, but jokes aside, let's get back to this big moment. Now we cut back to Clark telling Liz and Navarro that he would never hurt Annie Kay. As we go back to that moment, he's saying sorry to her. He's holding her. He takes off his shirt and begins to wipe off her wounds. And all of a sudden, she's awake. Which in my mind symbolizes all the times we heard she's awake throughout this show, or at least from Clark's perspective. As we watch Annie Kay screaming and yelling for him to stop, we don't actually see the moment, but we can see that he's covering her mouth and suffocating her as she screams and she eventually dies. But also I want to point out that he left that part out of his story of him being the one to actually take the last breath away from Annie Kay as he had her blood covering his chest. Now this is an impossible question to answer, but just in the context context of this show, what would you have done differently? Now to answer my own question, if I was in Annie Kay's position, it's tough. Do you keep this to yourself for the time being and then leave to tell people that are not associated with the minds of what you found in risk of the opportunity of not being able to go back? Or do you do as Annie Kay did, you destroy all that information because I'm sure she didn't think that these scientists were capable enough to kill her? But then on the other side of that question, what would you do if you were the scientists? What would you do if you were put in their position? Again, taking Clark's word for gospel, you discover a way to cure all diseases and cancer and you find this woman destroying years of research. Now, I'm just going to say it for myself. I don't think killing her is the right answer. There's definitely other ways they couldn't handle that situation. Again, I know this is a tough question, but if you were in the position of Annie Kay, what would you have done differently or would you have done the same thing? And if you were the scientist, what would you have done? I'm very intrigued to read your comments in the comment section below. Now, before moving on, I do have to point this out we've only spent maybe five minutes between annie k and the actress that played her and also the actor that's playing clark but that scene was extremely tense and you felt the emotion when he was killing her as he tells liz and navarro that he loved her like to me you saw both the look of utter sadness and anger from clark as all this stuff is going on you see that in his face but also the fight for her life and those screams from annie k i gotta give an applause to both actors that performance performance was great for both of them. Oh, and also screw Lun. I don't have any empathy of him getting his arm snapped off back in episode three. Hashtag justice for Annie. As Clark continues to tell them that it took over two years to rebuild what they lost, as Navarro says they cut out her tongue, but he claims that wasn't them. He tells them that a police officer, which we know is Hank, came to collect the body and that he must have been the one to cut out her tongue and leaving a message for the rest of the town. As Navarro looks at him in the eye and says to him, did you love her? As he responds, he did. Now she wasn't convinced and we see her pulling out her gun as Liz walks out without stopping her. Now we quickly cut back to the Wheeler case and we see him whistling twist and shout and immediately cut back to Navarro yelling at Clark as he begs and pleads for his life and we see her walking out leaving him alive at least for the time being. Now Liz tells Navarro that she was about to kill him herself as we cut back to what actually happened in the Wheeler case. As we see Navarro in the moment seeing the dead girl and Liz calling her name and she snaps back and shoots Wheeler point blank in the head. We cut back to the conversation as Liz needs to take a break and walks away. In this exact moment, if I'm being honest with you all, when I was watching this for the first time, the theories of Navarro being the one who killed the scientist because she has these blackout states and she's possessed was definitely becoming a reality because it appeared that the dead girl in that moment of Wheeler was pointing for her to kill him and we see that she did that with no questions asked. Which I guess in return makes me pose this question to you all in the comments. Was Navarro in some state of possession by the dead girl and killed Willer or did she do that out of rage, out of anger of the situation and knowing how she feels about women abusers, let me know your thoughts in the comments on your opinion in the comment section below. Now to answer my own question, I look at it as that was Navarro making her own choice. I'm going to compare it to what we got in season one of True Detective and that's this scene that you all can see on the screen now involving Marty. For me, I'm putting Navarro in that same mindset and we'll discuss this particular scene a little 
little bit later in this breakdown. Now, a lot just got revealed in this moment. I just want to take a moment to recap what we just found out. So number one, the scientist did stab Annie Kay nearly to death, but Clark was the one who actually killed her by suffocating her to death. And right now, it appears that Hank was the one to cut out Annie Kay's tongue. I have more thoughts about that a little bit later. And if we're sticking with that idea, it was probably Kate that told him to do that, to send that message. And we also found out that it was Navarro that killed Wheeler, but Liz did want to do it. So a lot to take in, a lot of big questions that were answered in this scene. As we get another message from the dead, we cut to seeing Liz, who's cutting up an orange, and out of nowhere, mysteriously, the orange falls in the exact spot to where Annie Kay's tongue was found. As Liz begins to investigate, she notices a mark that's left from the tongue on the floor, but Navarro walks in. As Navarro tells her that there's still a job that needs to be done, we see that Navarro looks at the peelings and it's in the same shape of the spiral as we see the lights are flickering. Now, I'll be honest, I don't quite understand the marking of the tongue being left there as a sign from the dead, potentially, but the Navarro of it all, seeing the orange peeling from Liz being the same of the spiral, which may be the same way her mother peeled, which again is another example of her mother trying to reach out to her. Now, Clark tells them that Annie Kay was the one who killed the scientists, and he claims that he kept seeing her and hearing her voice more and more, and he knew that she returned. As we cut to the opening scene of episode one, we see Clark running in fear. As we hear the others begging for their lives, and Clark ran and hid to the underground laboratory and locked himself in as he believed this was Annie Kay back from the dead getting her revenge. As we see Lund tries to get in, he questions what he's so afraid of, as we hear Lund screaming and begging please and the sounds start to fade away. As we see someone, or in Clark's mind, something trying to open the door as his light flickers and goes out, as we learn that Clark held this hatch for an hour for the span of an entire week. Now Clark claimed that he was too afraid to leave, but he eventually came up to get some food, which explains the scene back in episode one when the supply guy saw someone running across the screen. Clark also took this opportunity to meet Otis to learn about the situation but also learn how to survive Annie Kay. Now even though she wasn't born and this might be a reference to Setna as Clark claims Annie Kay was hiding in the caves forever. As Clark says, time is a flat circle and we are all stuck in it. A callback from season one from Russ saying the famous lines, this is a world where nothing is solved. Someone once told me time is a flat circle. Everything we've ever done or will do, we're going to do over and over and over again. Now Liz is fed up and she leaves the room, leaving Clark with Navarro as he begs her to end him or to at least let him do it. Now meanwhile, while Liz is trying to rest, she notices something in her hair and she finds Navarro's mother's own necklace, another important item from their past speaking to them, but again, they're ignoring it. We cut back to Peter with the bodies, and I love this shot of him driving down the street as the street lights cut off, almost symbolizing the light that he once had fading away as he gets rid of these bodies. Now back with Liz, she wakes up because of holding screams to his mom. She notices that the temperature has dropped and the power is out as she looks for Navarro and she sees that the door is open. As she finds Navarro outside looking at Clark's dead body frozen in the snow just like the scientist. Now Liz is clearly upset and she blames Navarro for allowing him to go out and cutting off the power, but you'll notice that Navarro only responded to not being the one to cut off the power, which to me implied that she did allow him to take his own life without stopping him. But the question is, why did he go outside and freeze to death? Did Clark willingly go out there to die or was something supernatural involved to make him take his own life or do we believe that Navarro helped him in this act? Honestly, I wish we could have saw what happened when Liz was asleep. Like, what was the scene that took place with Navarro as well as Clark? Now, we obviously find out later that she recorded his confession, but I wish that we would have saw the actual moment because was Navarro in a blackout state? Did she not notice when he left the room? Or again, did she allow it to happen? I'm very curious on why the show didn't give us that particular scene. Now, as they split up to look for a backup generator, I want you all to look at this scene. Look behind Navarro. Now, that's obviously a ghost, but I couldn't tell who that was. Was that Annie Kay? Was that someone else? Was that Jules? Or was that her mother? 
Let me know your suspicions and your theories of who this ghost is. But back with Liz, we see the rim of that tire appear from the opening credits as we see Liz check it out. As in my mind, this is her remembering the day that Holden and Jake died in that car accident. Now Navarro hears whispers calling to her and guides her as she follows and sees Clark as we get the reverse shot of what we saw the night of the science's death as the moment it appeared that he was being possessed. Now even after watching this multiple times, I'm still not sure on this scene as far as clarification let me know what you all interpreted this scene to be. Did Clark see Navarro in this moment? Did they look at each other face to face in that exact moment, but obviously in two different times? And this was all due to the fact that they're in the night country, aka the underworld where time and space doesn't exist? Because my mind goes to Clark mentioning time repeating itself. Maybe we're seeing after Clark died, his punishment is to relive that night and time of thinking of Annie returning to kill him and the scientist. Now this is me going off the deep end of theories and craziness. What if we're witnessing both Navarro and Liz and Clark in the night country? Meaning that they're all in between the dead and the living of the underworld. They're experiencing supernatural events with items from the dead and the dead being in the background. Are we witnessing them almost on the verge of death during the storm? Think about that. But in the meantime, we cut back to Peters, who's now at Rose's house to go to Julia's location because he's got someone who's going there as well. As Rose responds... It's gonna be one of those nights, isn't it? Now back with Liz and Navarro as both characters listen to the call from the dead. As we watch Navarro telling Liz there's something out there calling her and that there's so much more than just this and that it could be a comfort as Jules wasn't wrong. Now Liz responds by telling her that even though it's her sister, plain and simple, Jules just decided to quit. I don't think Navarro was trying to be rude or mean and try to clap back at her for mentioning her sister Jules, but we see Navarro does bring up Holden and mentions his eyes. As Navarro tries to tell Liz what she heard from her son, we see Liz shuts her up immediately. As Liz says that she doesn't know if he was trapped in the car, if he was scared, if he was hurt or screaming out her name, as Liz threatens Navarro. You wanna go out there and die? You wanna follow your ghosts and curl up in a ball and die out on the ice out there, you go ahead. But you leave my kid out of it! I will rip you apart! I am not merciful. To me, this scene right here is why you get Jodie Foster. It's not that she wasn't already doing an excellent job in the show before this particular scene, but this scene made me feel every single word. You feel the pain she had inside of her because of losing Holden. Just a very powerful scene which was paired perfectly to this very next scene, as to me, it hits on the idea of Liz living with the pain of losing her son and living for the dead and not alive for the living. As we cut to seeing Leah calling her and leaves her a voicemail of her not dying and to make it back to her, which really makes me rethink some of my feelings towards Leah this season. She's been living with this shell of a person and Liz. Meanwhile, she has nobody. Leah is alone and she's seeking family and comfort because she lost her brother and she lost her dad, but Liz doesn't seem to make time to talk to her about her feelings. Again, while it was shortly lived, but I really appreciated those small moments that we got from Leah in this scene, as well as Kayla earlier. And again, I just wish that we had more moments from both of those characters like this being one of the examples. We go back to Liz who's trying to get some sleep, but she can't go to sleep as she's looking for Navarro. She sees ashes leave her outside as she finds Navarro in the middle of the snow walking we cut to her in the same desert location that we've seen several times before as we see her ears are now bleeding as she walks further and further and Liz is screaming out to her I could be wrong but the ear bleeding might have been explained in this moment Maybe all the previous times she's been too afraid to listen and allowed her fears to get in the way of the voice trying to be heard in those screams representing her fears or the voices telling her that she's sick or has a mental illness, but this time it's different. She literally pushes through and receives the message. As we watch her reach her hand out and she officially gets her name. Now I mentioned this in my trailer breakdown of episode 6 and we don't really get the answer at all in this episode, but whose hand was reaching out to Navarro? Now to me, it can either be her mother's hand. Now even though we saw a shot of her mom hand point at her and I don't notice any tattoos on her hand, but who's to say that she didn't get any later down the road when they got older? Or maybe it could be one of Navarro's ancestors that's giving her this name. Either way, this was a very important moment for this character. A moment she regret of losing her mom and not knowing her name until now. Now while Navarro 
Carl gets that revelation, we cut over to Liz as she hears Holden screaming her name and she looks down on the ice and believes that as she's seeing him, she proceeds to bang on the ice and falls into the water and just when it appears that she's about to die, we see Navarro pulls her up and saves her. Now back inside, we cut to seeing Liz walking towards the car accident that killed her son and her husband, but she's wearing the same clothes of the present as we see the shot of her body disappearing in the water. Almost a representation of her dying or getting close to death as Navarro tries to bring her back from the night country and back to the land of the living. As we see this montage of memories of her with her son and her giving holding that bear to celebrate his birthday and other moments in between that brought them joy. This to me was a beautiful representation of these characters facing their fears and facing their demons. I believe Navarro going back to that desert and Liz going back to the car accident was both of them on the verge of dying, but it wasn't their time to go, but instead, facing what was holding them back. As throughout this series, they had one foot with the dead and one foot with the living, but they finally decided to overcome their trauma. To me, it was almost we were watching both these characters killing their past selves, metaphorically speaking, Liz in the water and Navarro with the storm, both of them having to come back on the other side to live, not with the memories or the heartbrokenness of losing their lost ones, well, at least not at the moment, right? Because inevitably we, we all die, but instead live with the memories of the ones they lost and carry on the experiences they had with the ones that they cherish the most. Now, again, I absolutely love how they played this out, but I will admit before moving Moving forward, I understand the subtext in Navarro in the desert area and that being like PTSD for her, but I really wish that we saw the event of what actually happened in that moment, but also what exactly did her partner tell her besides listen. But again, I get it. Sometimes you don't need to see every little detail. For example, we didn't see the actual car accident, what happened to Holden and Jake. We just understand that this was a traumatic moment for Liz, and the same thing could be said about Navarro. As Liz is awake, she asks Navarro what did Holden say as Navarro tells her that he says that he sees her and she covers one of Liz's eyes. If it wasn't already clear that the supernatural being a very important part of this story, this scene to me was the definitive answer. Because how else would you explain how Navarro knew that deep detail that wasn't shared with her between her and Holden. As we see Navarro holding Liz and she lets her emotions out for the first time this season about her loss and sharing it with someone else. We see Peter breaking the ice and this is cut between seeing Hank back from when he broke the ice to save his son Peter. Now making the narrative connection of him being saved by his dad only for years later the son is burying him after taking his life. Now Rose tells Peter not to look as she's preparing the body so it doesn't float in the water. As Rose tells him to finish what he started and close the door, I can't be the only one that feels like Rose has clearly done this before, especially after what she says next. As we watch him put his own father in the depths of the water, we see Peter gets a moment of clarity in which the man who raised him, loved him, and abused him is gone forever. As she tells Peter, the worst part hasn't come yet. What comes after forever is the worst part, as it's January 1st, the 15th day of night, we get a shot of the beautiful northern lights. Now for some it's believed that the northern lights are lights that are dancing waves of color and are powerful guardian spirits, and that these are the spirits of ancestors who come to meet and bless them. Now going back to what I talked about with Rose having might have done this before and I could be completely wrong but just thinking about when Peter goes to her about getting rid of a body and her not having any hesitation or asking any questions it makes me wonder to handle this situation. Now again she seems very much in tune with living out there in the snow when we first met her I mean we saw her gutting a wolf do you all have this feeling that she has gotten rid of a body in the past which just adds more leers and mystery to the character of Rose. As the storm has come Come to an end, we watch as Navarro continues to help Liz who's recovering after falling in the waters after they both face their demons. We see Liz wishes Navarro a happy new year as she recalls the time Navarro talked about walking out and disappearing and if she ever decides to do that in the future to come back. I want you all to remember that line for later in this breakdown. As we watch Navarro talk about what Clark did and how she's been holding the hatch for a while, this sparks an idea for Liz to get the DNA of who or what tried to open the hatch from when Clark tried to hide. We see Liz uses liquid chemicals and finds the fingerprints of the last person to grab the hatch, and it's missing two fingers, just like the fingerprints found on the scientist's clothes, and surprise, surprise, it is Blair. But the question is, who knows who killed Annie Kay as they head to their suspect? As they arrive to B's house, we remember that Blair has been staying there after getting into a fight with her ex-boyfriend. 
Now you'll notice when B asks who wants to discuss what happened to the scientists, you'll see that B looks right past Liz and looks directly at Navarro. As Navarro answers with her full name, which means the return of the sun after a long darkness. As this is what lets them in, but I want to focus on Navarro, this is them allowing her to be in and this having a double meaning. In making the narrative connection and taking the meaning of what that name means and applying it to the characters being in the darkness for most of the season, but having to return after their spiritual awakening after Salal. But also pointing out the character arc for Navarro, remember the scene back in episode 1 when she took the call about the fight at the crab factory and B asked her what her name was given to her. Or remember the time when we saw Navarro arresting Annie Kay and how the women treated her and even thinking about the time when Oliver did the same thing. So for her to now have her name and to say it with such integrity and pride, this was a moment that she finally filled embraced. Now inside, B tells them that the scientist was the one that killed Annie Kay. Now for the last six years, they thought that it was a town, but they finally understood. As we cut to seeing B cleaning at the station one day as she discovers the hidden lab. As she goes down to the station, she finds that star-like piece of equipment and while it's not too fully explained how she was able to make the connection, I would assume that it's because it's a small town and how Annie Kay's body was found most likely got around in the townspeople. As we see one of them taking photos of Annie Kay's body from the files as they manage to figure everything out, very similar to how Annie Kay understood what the men were doing in collaboration with the mines as they had everything they needed to finish their version of the story. Now the reason they didn't report this or get the cops involved is because this would have changed nothing. As we see the women that we've seen throughout the show enter the room as they wanted to change the story and have a different ending. Now as the story goes, we cut to seeing them together entering the station with guns in hand and taking each of the scientists one by one and we even see the moment where Clark hid and locked himself in the hatch and we see that it was Blair trying to open the hatch. I absolutely love the intense and digitous music in the background as we see this scene because to me it just made it so much more satisfying to experience what's about to happen to these scientists. Now Navarro flat out asks if these women killed them, which we see B responds by saying that they did it to themselves after digging into her home in the ice and killed her daughter and woke her. As she was saying this, we see them loading the scientists into the back of a truck. Now on many occasions we've spoken about the story of Setna on this channel in previous breakdowns and her mythical lore being throughout this show and pretty much confirmed in episode 4 of the True Detective podcast by its own creators. I want you all to take a listen to this clip. The story of Sedna still influences our culture today. Many Inupak women have tattoos of lines on their fingers to honor Sedna. While the story is open for interpretation, I believe it shows that humans are not in control of nature and that you should always be respectful and a little bit fearful of things outside of your control. I think it also represents the power and independence of Inubak women who should be treated with honor and respect. Now connecting what you all just heard from that podcast and connecting to the story, the scientists not only disrespected the land, but also disturbed the nature under the ice, but they also killed a woman in the process. Which led to, if you want to call it the nature or spiritual supernatural beings, I believe this led to Setna showing them ill will on their deaths. Now as they arrive to the location, they forced them to remove all their clothes and then make them walk out to the middle of the snow. As B says, if she wanted them, she would have took them and she says that if not, their clothes were there and they could have survived, but they didn't because she wanted to take them. And I love this line here from B herself as she says to Navarro and Liz, I guess she wanted to take them. I guess she ate their dreams from the inside out and spit their frozen bones. As we see that it was B the one that actually marked Lung with the spiral marking. Now for weeks we have been discussing how will the show explain what was actual reality and what was supernatural and I think they did a really good job in my personal opinion at handling this particular subject as the logical answer to the scientists was well without their clothes they froze to death but for those in the camp like myself that believe that Setna and the supernatural and the spiritual were involved in the show I believe that Setna or mother nature ate them and spit them out which would explain how their bodies were found. And whenever we would have a character referring to she, it was referring again to my opinion, the supernatural mother nature, Sedna, taking care of those bodies. But as we see B says, it's just a story. 
But I want to know in the comments, what do you all believe happened to the scientists with no clothes in that weather? Of course, they would have froze and their eyes and their ears and their fingers would have been bitten off. And those were the effects of being out there with hypothermia. And that's the scientific reasoning. But for those that believe that supernatural were involved in her death, let's have this fun discussion in the comments below. As we watch the women gather together in the kitchen and they say to Liz, what's it going to be? Will they take them in or will they let things be? As we watch Navarro says, Stories are stories. Now I want to play you guys another part from that same podcast in regards to explaining the importance of these stories. While some of these stories may seem shocking, Robin mentioned how preserving these traditions can ultimately bring connection and hope. With these stories, I really want to try to bring back the history of our people. So many of them are lost and I'm just trying to show that we had stories from a long time ago that are no longer being told by a lot of people anymore. As Liz tells them that the case is officially closed and we see Navarro waits behind, you'll see B gives her this acknowledgement or a sense of welcome or belonging, something Navarro has been wanting for a very long time. But the question remains, what about Annie Kay's tongue? As B says, it's not a part of their story and has no clue what she's talking about. Now, was that just a clue from the dead? Now, to answer my own question, I believe just like Holden's polar bear, Navarro's mom's necklace, the song Squish and Shout, or the orange, and now this tongue, these were messages or signs from the dead, like Rose said, them trying to reach out to the living and helping Liz and Navarro solve this case. Let's have this discussion in the comments respectfully because I can hear people screaming in the comments now, Liz and Navarro are going to allow these women to get away with murder, which technically they did kidnap the scientists and they took their clothes and let them walk in this bad weather. But again, they didn't technically kill them. But, you know, technicalities aside, I can hear you all saying that. And also Liz and Navarro get away with murder with killing Wheeler. Same could be said about obviously Peter shooting his dad. But in my response, I will respond by saying, do you all feel the same way about the masterpiece of season one of True Detective? And I'm referring to when we saw both Marty and Russ kill the killers to end the loop. It was fine then, right? Again, remembering time is a flat circle and this show obviously paying homage and paying his respects to what came before it. And while in my personal life, I do not agree with police officers taking the law in their own hands, but in the context of True Detective season one and here in season four and seeing the situation and getting to understand these characters, it made sense to me how they handled the situation. But again, let's talk about it respectfully in the comments below. As it's May 12th, five months later, the first long day of the year, we cut to seeing Liz getting investigated about what actually transpired. As they question what happened to Hank, as she says his ongoing investigation, as Otis was killed by Hank, and the story goes, Hank was seen on tape following Liz and Otis, and he must have killed him after Liz questioned him. As she believes there's a deal gone wrong, and Hank must have had an accident and gone missing in the blizzard. As Liz says, Come summer, we'll find him. We always do. Yes, we don't. We see Peter enters the room to give Liz some coffee as Liz tells them where his whereabout was during all these events, which essentially clears his name of any wrongdoings. Now they bring up how strange it was that Clark died in the same way as the others as Liz responds. Incredibly odd. Some questions just don't have answers. Which was a great response from this character because if you think about her philosophy earlier in the season and how now this is the complete opposite of her famous saying of throughout the show that everything has answers if you look for the right questions. But more importantly to the character, it shows she's taken more of an acceptance of the unknown after what happened at the Salal station and having her a spiritual awakening. Now what about Navarro as we cut to seeing Liz at Navarro's house to find out that she's gone. As we see Navarro has left Liz with Holden's bear, the same one that she threw out a couple episodes ago. She also gave back Kavik his toothbrush, but that's not all. As Liz says, she came here looking for something and found it. As we see her walking in the snow, which is a callback to her walking away from all those times throughout the show in the snow as someone was calling to her, but this time she's found herself and she knows who she is and she can move on. As we see Liz looking at the video recording of Navarro took before Clark took his own life. Now in this video is him detailing everything about the mines and the pollution and the effects it had on the town, but also its people. And this message would end up being leaked out. Now we don't see or hear the rest of the video, but one would assume that he confessed about Annie Kay's death as well. As we cut to seeing the mines have been shut down as we see the same man from back in the opening scene of episode one of this show. 
As we see, Liz states to the investigators that this town was here before the mines and it would be here long after. As we get our final shots of seeing Leah and Liz happy in the car, you'll also notice that Leah has the tattoos on her face, meaning that she's embraced her heritage, and also Liz accepts this. As Liz says, they will not find Navarro's body out on the ice, which to me meant that she's not going to be found dead like the others because she's more connected than ever before to her spiritual experience. We get to see Peter with his son, which to me implies everything worked out between him and Kayla. In our last shot, we hear them ask about the sightings of Navarro as we see Liz walking out to her balcony and says, Well, this is Ennis. Nobody ever really leaves. As we see, Navarro appears. I to kind of detail that moment of Navarro walking in the snow and also appearing on the balcony of Liz, remembering what B said, if she wants you, she'll take you. And if she doesn't, you'll survive. Now, if we follow the idea of this belief of allowing Mother Nature or the Mother of the Sea and Satna to get into this discussion and bringing it back to the character Navarro, she came out of the darkness and into the sun. It's taking a moment to speak about the supernatural, which again, I am firm into the count that the show was hinting at Setna being the supernatural entity in the town and the town's legend. Setna is the one that B was referring to in the caves. The night country picks and chooses who lives and dies. Now, I'll be addressing or making theories during our after show or making a separate video about the following unanswered questions. What was the deal with Annie Kay's dreams of the spiral tattoo and what was going on in Clark's trailer? What about Kate and Connolly and the Tuttle family and also Rose? What happened to Otis all those years ago? What happened to Oliver? The use and the meaning of the spiral as it pertains to the story. So again, keep an eye out for maybe a separate video or watching a replay on my after show to address those unanswered questions. Now, keeping the tradition alive and naming these episodes, I'm going to name this finale Stories Are Stories. Make sure to share your title in the comments below. Now, wrapping up this video with my final review of the finale and my overall thoughts of the show, I've seen the finale two times at the time of this recording, and I can say that I definitely enjoyed the finale the second time around came to really appreciate the narrative of seeing both characters facing their past and dealing with their traumatic experiences head on. Liz being someone who shut herself off to people at work or someone like Navarro who cared about solving Annie Kay's case all those years later and looking at how she treated Leah, but seeing her growth, but also her belief in something more out there and her taking in the messaging from Holden. And also, as expected, what an incredible performance by Jodie Foster. I'm taking a moment to talk about the star of this show, and that's Kaylee Reese as Navarro, a very complex and flawed character who was led by rage and shut herself off to others, but cared deeply about the only person she cared for, which was her sister Jules. And after losing Jules and her reflecting on her mother not giving her a name, to seeing where she ended up to me was beautifully written and performed incredibly well. I can't wait to see what Kaylee has lined up next because she was a bona fide star in the show, in my personal opinion. I was a fan of Issa Lopez prior to this show, but now I'm a bigger fan. Now, I know it wasn't for everyone, but the way she handled the supernatural and the grounded nature to the story and mixed it with each episode with us questioning what was real and what wasn't, to me, made this a thrilling story and a wonderful experience from beginning to the end. Now, I've said it in past videos, but my main criticism is the six episode format. It didn't allow some of the supporting characters to fully be realized. For example, Hank's story with his bride and wanted more of his relationship with Peter instead. Peter and Kayla and their marriage. Leah's story feeling kind of rushed at points, but also not getting full closure to what happened with Kate and Connolly and even Oliver. I feel as though eight to nine episodes would have benefited for those characters and those subplots. Again, I wouldn't say I was unsatisfied, but it would have enhanced the series for me if we would have had more time with those characters and those subplots. So I would give this finale a high eight out of 10, great tension, the main questions getting answered and seeing a good conclusion to our leads. Now overall for the season, I'm going to give it a solid 8.5 out of 10. Overall, very pleased with the story, the sense of the horror, I love the environment and the mystery surrounding everything. And I would have to say, this is my second favorite season behind season one, but also in front of season three and followed by season two being my least favorite season of True Detective.
I would say my favorite character of the entire series is Navarro. My favorite episode was probably episode five. So make sure to leave your final thoughts, your score, the finale, season overall, where this season ranks for you. Let me know your favorite character and your favorite episode in the comments below. Now, as I said up top, I can't thank you all enough for supporting these videos. I know they were long, but I thank you all so, so much. Now, if you're still here watching this video at this point, you are the true MVP. So do me a favor right now in the comments put hashtag stories are stories now while this might be the end i do have a few more videos planned for the show but also join me live right now sunday night for our live after show as i'll be taking your live questions and sharing more thoughts about this finale in the series so come and join us for the live after show you all are awesome stay safe and i'll catch you all on the next video